Good morning, everyone. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm Senior Vice President here at the Atlantic Council and Director of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 Atlantic Council East, East Asia Foundation Strategic Dialogue. I'd also like to take this opportunity to expend, extend a special welcome to our distinguished delegation of speakers. There are many, uh, Minister Kim, Dr. Moon, Special Representative Lee, uh, distinguished members of the Korean National Assembly and Professor Wong, all of them traveled a long distance from the Republic of Korea uh, along with our partners at the East Asia Foundation to be here today, so we're really grateful that they've made this trip. Um, and I really have to say this is a great time to be convening such an accomplished group uh, to help us move the ball forward on the Korean uh, peninsula negotiation process. This is just a really good time. I think we're going to hear really um, important um, statements and our goal here as always at the Atlantic Council is to move the ball and help uh, uh, strengthen uh, peace and prosperity in the region. I'd like to get things started by introducing our opening speaker for today's strategic dialogue and that is Atlantic Council Board Director Congressman Michael J. Rogers. Congressman Rogers is a former member of Congress representing Michigan's 8th Congressional District, an officer in the U.S. Army, and an FBI special agent. During his time in the U.S. House of Representatives, he chaired the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He was a member of the Energy and Commerce Panel. Uh, he focused on a range of issues, but in, in particular on issues such as counterterrorism, national security policy, health care telecommunications and, and automotive issues, so a wide range of issues that he advanced. In addition to the many positions that he currently holds, Congressman Rogers is the host and executive producer of Declassified, Untold Stories of American Spies on CNN, where he also appears as a national security commentator. We are really delighted to have him here today. I'm a huge fan of his, and so uh, very much looking forward to hearing his thoughts. And I'd like to invite him to the stage now to deliver his opening remarks. Congressman Rogers. Let me get reconnected here. Actually, I'll do that afterwards. Well, welcome. I uh, am honored to see such a big crowd. I, like you, believe this is probably one of the most significant speeches, or at least conversations, that's going to happen in town today. So thank you for participating in it. Uh, as they said, I'm Mike Rogers. Uh, I'm a board of director here at the Atlantic Council. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 Atlantic Council East Asian Foundation Strategic Dialogue. I'd also like to take this opportunity to extend a special welcome to our distinguished delegation of speakers. Minister Kim, thank you very, very much. Uh, Dr. Moon, Special Representative Lee, and distinguished members of the National Assembly who are here with us today, all of whom have traveled from the Republic of Korea to be here with us. So thank you very, very much for being here. We look forward to your comments this afternoon. How about a warm Atlantic Council welcome for our Korean friends here today? <laughs> Apparently that back section needs a little more caffeine, I think. <laughs> This is the second time that the Council's Asia Security Initiative housed within the Scowcroft Center for Strategic uh, uh, Strategy and Security is hosting this strategic dialogue with generous support of the East Asia Foundation. As we start today's conference, I think it's important to reflect on the outlook of the Korean Peninsula and how it shifted since we first convened the dialogue in May of 2018. Uh, if you recall, at that time, there was a real pattern between the Kim Jong-un we know, his father, and his grandfather. Bad behavior, provocative actions, uh, sometimes even a provocative act, getting the attention that he wanted or deserved, or maybe even an aid shipment. He'd slow down and repeat again. And we've seen that pattern. And boy, and since, the last, since last May, we've seen some things that have given us hope and optimism. Uh, and at that time, uh, we really focused on one single phrase, cautious optimism. In fact, uh, the first few days before the strategic dialogue, the world watched in awe as President Moon and Chairman Kim joined hands and stepped together over the border into North Korea. In that visually striking moment, it became clear that we were cautious after repeated deceptions of the past, but still that's where our optimism crept in. 
the Panmunjom Declaration that followed promised a permanent, peaceful, denuclearized future for the Korean Peninsula. Some saw the Panmunjom Declaration and Singapore Joint Declaration as necessary foundational documents for future progress. Others argue that Kim Jong-un was already getting too much for too little. Regardless, it was clear after Singapore that we still needed to ex an explicit roadmap to final, fully justifiable and verifiable denuclearization, and most, the most difficult days were still ahead of us. One year later, we're still waiting for that roadmap. In the months since the second Trump-Kim summit in Hanoi concluded, without a signed agreement, we've seen a strong dose of realism, increasingly temper the cautious optimism of, near, of early negotiations. Today, breakthrough is stalled, and stalled negotiations seems our only hope to achieve these goals laid out in the Panmunjom in Singapore. And by the way, I've invited both of our speakers today to go ahead and conduct the meeting in front of us. We won't tell anyone of those conversations. I think they've almost agreed to that, I think. We're getting close. <laughs> Leaders in the United States and Republic of Korea, including our distinguished guests, Special Representative Began and Special Representative Lee, have been working tirelessly, and I want to emphasize that. They just flew in uh, early this morning, really, in the wee hours of the morning to be here, uh, so that they can deliver a breakthrough uh, that can bring peace and prosperity to the Korean Peninsula. And despite ongoing setbacks, there may still be a chance to make the promises of Panmunjom and Singapore into reality, even if we're running out of time. And that's exactly why we're here today. The strategic dialogue <clears throat> is a rare opportunity to bring together officials, experts, and policymakers from the United States and the Republic of Korea to exchange insights and develop concrete recommendations that can help us find a path forward in negotiations. At the same time, today's conference is also a chance to seek a longer-term view of the Korean Peninsula's greater strategic role in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly as the strategic competition between the United States and China continues to intensify. I will uh, just remind you today that we have, as, as we've said, an incredible group of speakers, lots and lots of attention on what's going to happen here today uh, and the dialogue that follows. Uh, but before we jump into things, I want to remind everyone that all of today's discussions are public and on the record. You can follow the conversation online on Twitter at AC Scowcroft and using the hashtag uh, at uh, AC Asia and welcome you to do that and welcome you uh, to comment along the way. We think it's a better dialogue with broader participation. And with that, I'm going to close knowing that we have the minister to follow uh, and our great representatives who are going to lay out the strategy for the future. At least that's what I'm hoping they'll do anyway. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll talk to you in a minute. This is not a relay race where I keep coming back and forth. You won't see me that much. But I wanted to uh, thank you, Congressman Rogers. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Minister Sung Hwan Kim, the former uh, South Korea Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade and a board member of the East Asia Foundation. We've hosted him here before, and it's always been a great uh, discussion. Minister Kim is a career diplomat who served as minister from 2010 to 2013. In his 36-year career, he's held numerous diplomatic posts, including Senior Secretary to the President for Foreign Affairs and National Security and Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He was the Republic of Korea's ambassador to, Aus to Austria, to Uzbekistan, and permanent representative to international organizations in Vienna. After retiring from the Foreign Service, Minister Kim served as the chair of the Institute for Global Social Responsibility and distinguished visiting professor at Seoul University until March 2015. Now he's working as a distinguished visiting professor at Hong Yang University. Please join me in welcoming Minister Kim to the stage for his remarks. Thanks very much. Thank you very for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to have this second strategic dialogue between Atlantic Council and East Asia Foundation. On behalf of East Asia Foundation, I wish to express my thanks to all the participants in this dialogue and I sincerely welcome all of you. Taking this opportunity, I wish to express my gratitude to President Fred Kemp and Senior Vice President Ver Pavel and uh, Congressman Michael Rogers and Ambassador Cho Yunje for their efforts to make this strategic dialogue 
more rewarding and fruitful. I also express my special thanks to today's keynote speakers, Ambassador Stephen Began, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Ambassador Lee Do-hun, ROK Special Representative for Korean Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs, and Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, former Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs, and Professor Moon Jong-in, Special Advisor to the President for Unification and National Security Affairs. I also wish to convey my thanks to four members of Korean National Assembly who joined this strategic dialogue despite their busy schedule in the National Assembly. Chief Spokesman Hong Yik Pyo and the Spokeswoman Lee Jae Jung from the ruling Democratic Party, National Assembly Woman Park Sun Suk from Baren Mire Party, and National Assemblyman Kim Jong Dae from Justice Party. Korean delegation is specially reinforced by their participation. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as you remember, one year ago, President Trump and the Chairman Kim Jong-un had their first summit in Singapore and agreed to resolve key issues, including the denuclearization of North Korea and the establishment of peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. At the time, we had high hope and expectation on the resolution of North Korean nuclear issue and the sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. However, even after this historic agreement between the U.S. and North Korea, the situation on the Korean Peninsula has not changed as quickly as we expected. There have been no bold follow-on measures to support the Singapore Agreement, and denuclearization talks between the U.S. and North Korea remain stuck in stalemate after the second summit in Hanoi last February. I think the reason for the no deal in the Hanoi summit lies in the fact that North Korea and the U.S. interpreted the Singapore Agreement from the different perspective. North Korea wants to implement the Singapore Agreement gradually in phases, but the U.S. wants to see the progress in establishing trust and achieving denuclearization at the same time. I think the biggest problem in dealing with the North Korean nuclear issue is that U.S. and North Korea do not share the common understanding on the definition and targets of denuclearization of North Korea. North Korea's proposal of denuclearizing facilities in Yangbyon is a meaningful and important step in denuclearization process. However, as both sides do not have a common understanding on the final state of denuclearization, I think this proposal lost its value. I believe the most compelling task at, the, at this time is not to lose dialogue momentum between the two sides. If the current impasse continues after the end of this year, I'm afraid dialogue list state can be extended. But uh, in this regard, however, it is encouraging to see that in recent days, both sides are making efforts to revive dialogue momentum. Last week, uh, as we all heard, President Trump said he received a beautiful letter from Chairman Kim and National Security Advisor John Bolton mentioned that the third summit is entirely possible. I strongly believe that now is the time for both sides to show flexible attitude towards the progress. North Korea should convince the U.S. that they made a strategic decision to give up all the existing nuclear weapons and facilities by taking bold steps and immediately come to the high-level talks with the U.S. On the US, part of the U.S., it should address concerns of North Korea more seriously and concretely. I sincerely wish that today's gathering of opinion leaders of both countries, such as congressmen, government officers, and policy advisors, will provide valuable wisdom to get out of current impasse. And before I conclude my remarks, uh, let me take a few moments to introduce East Asia Foundation. East Asia Foundation was organized in 2005 with a generous funding from Hyundai Motor Company with a view to broaden knowledge networks. We have maintained exchanges with a number of institutions and universities in the United States, Japan, and China. We also publish a uh, quarterly English journal, Global Asia, which is available at the desk outside. Once again, thank you to all of you for participating in the second strategic dialogue between Atlantic Council and East Asia Foundation. 
and particularly those who laboriously prepared today's meeting. Thank you. I have the privilege today to uh, introduce for the first time speaking publicly in the United States, uh, Representative Lee, and we're deeply honored that he chose to do this at the Atlantic Council today. Thank you, sir, very, very much. And to know why we have such, I think, a strong bond with our South Korean friends and allies, there's nothing more, I think, stronger than the personal bond. We were sharing stories prior to this meeting about both of our sons going into military service, his son in the Air Force, my son in the Navy. Uh, and then we talked about our military service, and we've decided that the longer we're away from it, the better we were at our military service. I think we've come to that conclusion, which goes to show you for anyone who's served, nothing changes in either country. It's the same, which I love. Thank you for that. And we're going to share FBI stories later, we've decided as well, uh, 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 over, a, over a glass of wine, I hope. <laughs> Uh, I have the, the really uh, honor and, and privilege to represent Ambassador Lee as the special representative of the Korea Peninsula Peace and Security Affairs for the Republic of, of uh, Korea. Prior to this, uh, his current position, he has been a career diplomat for 35 years, ambassador to the Republic of Serbia, director general for the Republic of the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs, North Korean Nuclear Affairs Bureau, minister to the Korean Embassy in the Islamic Republic of Iran, counselor to the Korean Permanent Mission to the United Nations in the United States from 2005 to 2008. He served as secretary to the President of Foreign Affairs at the Office of the President in his most recent assignment. No, no small burden do these gentlemen take, uh, and it's no small honor that I get to introduce Ambassador Lee. Thank you, Congressman Rogers, for your kind introduction. Well, I definitely look, look forward to uh, having a you know, your listening your stories over a glass of wine. Uh, two years ago, President Moon Jae-in was uh, awarded the prestigious Global Citizen Award by the Atlantic Council in New York. The award the ceremony was, was held in the midst of a heightening tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Yet, President, Trump, uh, President Moon stood before you and expressed his unwavering conviction. Yeah, my previous speaker was much taller than I was. <laughs> conviction that uh, there will be there will come a time to speak to you about the legacy of a peace that Korea has built on the Korean Peninsula. Although that, that time has not yet arrived, I'm happy to share with you today the rigorous work Korea and the United States have done together over the last two years towards this common goal ahead of the upcoming visit to Korea by President Trump next week. Thank you. Back in July 2017, President Moon declared in Berlin a Korean peninsula free from the threat of nuclear weapons and war. A Korean peninsula of a mutual respect and a shared prosperity. Ever since, my government's vision for the Korean Peninsula can be summarized to include complete denuclearization, a lasting peace, and bright future for common prosperity. President Trump has, on his part, time and again expressed his deep and personal commitment to see an end to 70, year of 70 years of war and hostility on the Korean Peninsula. He has made a bold decision to engage directly with the North Korean leader and begin a groundbreaking process to achieve the goal of denuclearization and economic development of North Korea. Neither leader had expected this to be an easy undertaking. The decision to engage with North Korea should be deemed more noble and audacious in light of the two and a half decades of dis disappointments and frustrations. Last week in Sweden, President Moon Jae-in urged North Korea to re-engage in dialogues with the outside world, whether they be bilateral or multilateral. 
Today, I will reiterate this same message. A strategic decision by North Korea will drastically improve its global image and the livelihood of the, its people. Such a decision will go down in history as one of the most significant decisions ever made in the long history of Korea. But in order to make history, North Korea must have the courage to grab the opportunity when it presents itself. Certainly, Chairman Kim's latest letter delivered to the President Trump will keep the momentum of dialogue alive for now. But we now await another critical decision by Chairman Kim to keep, quote, the flow of inter-Korean relations on the path towards peace, prosperity, and reunification, unquote, as expressed by himself in his condolence letter delivered on the passing of the late former First Lady. On the other hand, those that are seated around the negotiating table, including my country, Korea, must also understand that we are dealing with a North Korea that proclaims to have completed its nuclear armament. The lost decade of so-called strategic patience, relying solely on the eventual impact of sanctions, has only led us farther away from the goal of denuclearization. In fact, by November 2017, North Korea officially announced the completion of its state nuclear force, representing a sea change in denuclearization talks. Now, negotiating with North Korea is no longer an option, but a necessity. I do not wish to oversimplify the challenge of bringing North Korea to the state of denuclearization. Nonetheless, I would argue that there are two key incentives for the North to come to the negotiating table. First, guaranteeing the security of North Korea to the extent that they can feel the safety in giving up their nuclear weapons and programs. Second, presenting the possibility of a sanctions-free future that no longer burdens North Korea's economy, along with a vision of a bright future once the North Korea follows through with its denuclearization commitments. My government also stands ready to do what needs to be done. In this regard, I urge North Korea to respond to President Moon's outstanding invitation to hold inter-Korean summit, if possible, before President Trump visits Korea next week. To achieve these goals, my government has meticulously drawn from the lessons learned and took into account the changed negotiations environment. The following are some of the notable features that make up the denuclearization policy of the Korean government. First, we will not resort to the use of unpeaceful means in our pursuit of a peace on the Korean Peninsula. Obviously, the use of a force on the Korean Peninsula will not, not only lead to an outcome of catastrophic nature, not only for the two Koreas, but for all of Northeast Asia and beyond. Those who think that one can control the escalation of tensions against a society as complex and opaque as North Korea are merely fooling themselves. The lessons of the First World War should be sufficient grounds for me to rest my case. This is why we must continue the two-track approach of dialogue and sanctions. My government has reiterated that we will continue to implement international sanctions until we are assured that complete denuclearization has been achieved. Yet, sanctions are not a magical solution they are merely a tool for bringing about a solution through negotiations. In the end, no negotiations means no progress. You may walk the path of sanctions, but without going through the door of dialogue, you cannot enter the room of resolving the nuclear issue. Second, we pursue a comprehensive agree agreement. The parties at the negotiation table must lay out all matters of interest and strike a balance in equivalence and in kind among the measures to be taken by each side. In the past, when North Korea's nuclear program was still under development, merely hanging 
me merely halting the program could have been an achievement. But now we have no choice but to seek a fundamental solution, complete denuclearization and establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. If we are to demand the full resolution of the nuclear issue, we should also be prepared to address the full set of concerns raised by North Korea. Unlike the six party talks, which had placed the issues such as peace regime and normalization of relations toward the tail end of the process, we now need to bring all matters of importance to the forefront and incorporate them into comprehensive agreement. Third, we will maintain the top-down approach, which has been instrumental. The current process is driven by strong political momentum created through summit diplomacy among the leaders of the two Koreas and the United States. Former negotiators could only have dreamed of the, such circumstances. For instance, the September 19th joint statement was crafted through years of working level negotiations that continued day and night only to get as far as the disablement of five nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. Although the Hanoi summit did not produce an agreement, the top-down approach remains the best option at this time, when the leaders of the South, North, and the United States continue to exhibit strong political determination to make progress. At the same time, our experience in Hanoi has taught us that there is a room for improvement to the top-down approach. And that is why we will continue to supplement this approach with a greater efforts at the working level. Lastly, close collaboration between Korea and the United States will continue to be the foundation of our North Korea policy. Since the first North Korea nuclear crisis broke out in 1991, Korea has maintained close coordination with the United States on this issue. And over the years, our joint efforts to resolve this issue through diplomacy have gained greater depth. Although the 1994 agreed framework was ostensibly a US-North Korea agreement, a US-North Korea agreement, subsequent progress such as the September 19th joint statement of the six party talks and later culminating in the Leap Day Agreement were made possible on the basis of close coordination between Korea and the United States. It was often said that to get from Pyongyang to Washington, you have to go through Seoul. I would like to emphasize that for the Korean people, complete denuclearization and establishing a lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula are not distant goals or vague rhetoric. It is a matter of life and death. That's, that is why my government will continue to play a key role in ensuring the success of our efforts to bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. Now we are pursuing a South-North-US centric dialogue process anchored on the watertight coordination between Seoul and Washington from the working level to the highest echelon of both governments. Last August, a spe special representative, Steve Began, who is with us today, took on his job. And in November, we launched the Korea-US Working Group, which now functions as the, an, an important coordination mechanism for advancing the Korean Peninsula peace process. In the first four months since Steve started working with us, we met over 20 times. After a while, we stopped counting because regardless of what some critics may say about the state of our bilateral relationship, we really have nothing more to prove. There has been much discussion on the idea of a bright future for North Korea. I have no doubt that Chairman Kim's top priority would be to ensure a security guarantee. But I also believe that he is keen to improve the livelihood of the people. A careful reading of decisions made at the Workers' Party's meeting, this year's New Year's address, and the recent policy speech all point to a conspicuous emphasis on economic development. President Moon Jae-in's Berlin in Initiative outlines a vision of two Koreas living side by side in prosperity. This is a long-term vision, vision 
that can be achieved in accordance with the progress in complete denuclearization and the establishment of peace. This idea was once again highlighted by President Moon in Oslo last week when he spoke about his belief in the idea of a positive peace and peace for the people that changes the everyday lives of people. On many occasions, President Trump also pointed to the economic potential of North Korea. President Trump has made it clear that should North Korea follow through on Chair Kim, Chairman Kim's commitment to denuclearization, the U.S. will in return exceed anything previously thought possible. I'm confident that the President Trump will make good on his proposal to bring a brighter future for to North Korea and its people. It is clear that three leaders have their sights set in the same direction. If we were to make substantive progress in denuclearization, we should be able to begin this process in earnest. If we can do that, I'm confident that the international community will follow suit, as the bright future that we speak of will not only benefit North Korea, but also the entire Korean peninsula and beyond. S some have assessed that the second U.S.-North Korea summit in Hanoi as a failure, but I disagree. Instead, the Hanoi summit should be seen as part of a longer process and even a springboard to make a greater leap forward. Considering the following aspects, this may be an unprecedented golden opportunity for North Korea that cannot be left to be squandered. First of all, never in the past have the top leaders of the two, two Koreas and the United States been so invested in resolving this issue. North Korea is on the front burner in the White House for the first time ever. Never before has the leader of North Korea expressed his willingness toward complete denuclearization in person and on camera for the world to see. And the current administration in Korea is playing a far more proactive role than ever before. Complementing these political wills among leaders, the personal trust built among them are valuable assets that we did not have in the past. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Choi Soon Hee publicly pointed out that President Trump and Chairman Kim had, quote, mysteriously wonderful relationship, unquote. On top of that, there exists a genuine meeting of minds among the working level negotiators. You already know that I, and I, met St I meet Steve much too often, but I have also met Vice, uh, Vice Foreign Minister Choi Soon Hee on various occasions. I will just say that she is an expert, well versed in the nuclear issue and is someone who I can have a serious discussion with. I also continue to hold in-depth consultations with my counterparts from Japan, China and Russia. Lastly, the entire international community has put in its support behind the current dialogue process. I believe President Xi Jinping's visit to North Korea over the next two days would be another opportunity to reignite the dialogue process. Last week in Sweden, President Moon spoke of an important trust, in the importance of a trust in building peace. Within the context of the denuclearization dialogue with North Korea, failures of past negotiations have led to serious cases of a trust deficit among those seated around, around the negotiating table. In an effort to mitigate this problem that fundamentally hinders serious discussions, my government has been pursuing a series of confidence building measures with the North, the latest among which being the decision to provide food aid. With this in mind, when dialogue is resumed, all parties should make sincere efforts to bring about visible results, however small, at the earliest possible stage to maintain the strength, strengthen the mo momentum for dialogue. This will prove to all parties involved that choosing negotiations for denuclearization and peace building was not a mistake. We should not let our blind faith lead us to repeating our past mistakes, nor should we let our future slip away because of groundless mistrust. 
In the not too distant future, I hope the President Moon Jae-in will be able to keep his promise made two years ago and speak to you about the success story of a peace on the Korean Peninsula and how, and how North Korea achieved its bright future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Representative Lee. We enjoyed your remarks. We look forward to some conversation subsequent. I have the great uh, ple pleasure to introduce uh, a fellow Michiganian, uh, Special Representative Steve Began, which is why I know we're in such great hands. And for those of you who have ever visited Michigan, you know why we're in such great hands with Steve at the Hill. In August of uh, 2018, Steve was appointed U.S. Special Representative for North Korea. Uh, as Special Representative, he directs all policy on North Korea on behalf of the Secretary of State, leads negotiations, and spearheads U.S. diplomatic efforts with allies and partners. Special Representative Began has three decades of experience in the executive and legislative branches in the government, as well as the private sector, most recently Vice President of International Government Relations at Ford Motor Company. Previously, as a national security advisor to the Senate Majority Leader, Bill Frist, he provided analysis and strategic planning for the Senate's consideration of foreign policy, defense, and intelligence matters and international trade agreements. Prior to that, he worked in the White House from about 2001 to 2003 as Executive Secretary for the National Security Council. Serves as a senior staff member to the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, in that role, and performed the function of Chief Operating Officer for the National Security Council. Before joining the White House staff, Special Representative uh, Began has served for 14 years as a foreign policy advisor to members of both the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. During that time, he held a position as Chief of Staff for the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, in addition, he served as a senior staff member, and I argue maybe his most important role, in the U.S. House of Representatives uh, on the Committee of Foreign Affairs for about six years. Uh, Steve has an impressive record both in and out of government uh, and a certainly a job that he is well suited to tackle. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador. Oh, excuse me, Representative. Almost. I almost got you promoted. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you for coming out today and uh, giving us an opportunity uh, to speak with you about this very important issue. I'd like to extend my greetings as well to the many dignitaries who are here today. I won't single them out. It's, they've all been introduced, and you'll hear from many of them uh, during the course of the day. I also want to thank the Atlantic Council uh, for, and the East Asia Foundation for providing uh, Representative Lee and myself this opportunity to take this stage to have this conversation at such an important moment. I'd like to extend my thanks to Fred Kemp, uh, Damon Wilson, uh, Barry Pavel, the lead, who's led this uh, event, as well as the many scholars here, including Myung Oh, Sandy Verschbau, Bob Manning, others, who very quickly after I took this position, I, I came with advice, counsel, and shared their experience over many, many years uh, trying to resolve these important issues on the Korean Peninsula. I also want to thank my uh, colleague and partner in diplomacy, uh, Ambassador Ida Hoon. Uh, Ambassador Lee uh, is a uh, tremendous uh, and capable partner in conducting this diplomacy. We have forged a close working relationship over many months, and I have to say that uh, in the many, many nights that I have spent in Seoul over the course of the past year, uh, at times my hotel room uh, high up in, in one of the hotels in downtown Seoul has faced the Ministry of Foreign Affairs building, MOFA. Late into the night, there is one floor high up in that building with the lights still on. It's where Ambassador Lee and his team work tirelessly uh, it, it, and with the work that's necessary to resolve such an important issue. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a tremendous privilege to work with you, and thank you for being here today. As important as the foundation is uh, that Ambassador Lee and I, that our two governments have formed, I do want to highlight the fact that this is much broader than even the United States and South Korea. In fact, we are joined with a broad international coalition of partners and allies working together in common cause to achieve, through diplomacy, 
the elimination of weapons of mass destruction in North Korea. And in doing so, it is our objective to create the conditions for a more lasting and permanent peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Within this group of countries working in partnership includes the UN Security Council, which has acted numerous times in recent years with complete unanimity, insisting upon the elimination of the weapons of mass destruction that are on the Korean Peninsula, and also adding strong economic pressure to create the right set of incentives to complete that task. Of course, within the, within the uh, region itself, there is no closer partnership than ours with South Korea, as well as with Japan, our two allies in East Asia, who are critical to resolving this issue and bringing a permanent peace and stability to the region. Add to that our NATO allies and our Five Eyes partners, who even uh, for countries operating well beyond their borders, uh, join us in policing and enforcing the sanctions and work with us very closely in international bodies to ensure that we make progress on our ultimate objective. Also, the European Union and ASEAN have been tremendous partners, and even Russia and China have partnered with us in trying to achieve the goal of the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I will say there are many areas of discord in U.S. relations with both Russia and China, but in both cases we have been able to forge a level of cooperation around a common interest to bring peace and stability to the Korean Peninsula and to the elimination of weapons of mass destruction. Um, we work very closely with them, we regularly consult with them, and we know from our discussions and from our uh, ongoing work that they send consistently the right message uh, to North Korea, that there is a brighter future possible, but it must pre be preceded by the elimination of weapons of mass destruction. I would like to give you a bit of a timeline on what we've been up to uh, uh, since the Singapore summit one year ago. This is an opportune moment for us uh, to review where we have been as we talk further about where we have to go. And normally I would start that timeline uh, in, uh, on June 12th when President Trump met with uh, Chairman Kim in the historic summit in Singapore. But because of the stage I'm sharing and because of the company, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't go back a little bit further to the tremendous leadership shown by President Moon Jae-in of South Korea in first sensing the opportunity and then seizing the opportunity and then nurturing the opportunity that we have to achieve these lofty objectives through diplomacy. Uh, the South Korean uh, government is in very good hands. We have great confidence that President Moon will continue uh, with us on the path towards achieving our shared objectives and President Trump will be in Seoul in just over a week from now uh, for a meeting which I'm sure will deliver very productive results uh, for both of our countries. But starting in June, uh, which is when the United States narrative begins, we had the most uh, important event probably in the history of U.S.-North Korean relations, certainly since the end of the Korean War in 1953. Uh, for the first time, we had a leader-level leader meeting uh, between our two countries that launched a process of diplomacy that Ambassador Lee Dohoon and myself are responsible to continue to drive forward today. That Singapore summit uh, was an act of leadership by President Trump, and I thank Ambassador Lee for his kind words uh, for President Trump's initiative. It didn't resolve every issue that we have before us, but it set in motion important pathways for progress in which we and our North Korean interlocutors have comfortably continued to negotiate since that meeting in Singapore. Out of the Singapore summit came a joint statement, a relatively high level agreement, one page in length, in which the two leaders committed to four specific areas of continued engagement in an attempt to resolve the issues on the Korean Peninsula. The first area was the transformation of relations between our two countries. The second area was the establishment of a permanent peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. The third was the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And the final commitment was the recovery of the remains of American servicemen who fell in the Korean War. Each of these offers me, as a negotiator, enormous opportunity to carve out imaginative ideas, opportunities for us to progress towards ultimate objectives in each of these areas, and as Ambassador Lee said a moment ago, push us to the forefront 
all of the issues which we must discuss between the United States and North Korea to achieve lasting peace and stability. The Singapore summit uh, was followed about a month later by a visit by Secretary of State Pompeo to Pyongyang. That's that meeting in Pyongyang which was expected to begin the implementation and progress on bringing the agreements of our two leaders uh, to reality. In fact, uh, was a, a moment of enlightenment for both sides that we still had an enormous amount of preparatory work to do in order to be able to make progress on the direction of our two leaders. That meeting was followed a few months later by the appointment of myself as the new special representative uh, for the United States. And on my first week in the, in the position in late August of, of 2018, I was due to join Secretary Pompeo on a trip to Pyongyang uh, to continue the process of implementing the Singapore agreements. Uh, an exchange of messages between us and the North Koreans suggested that the gap between our two sides remained still quite large the President made the judgment that that meeting may not deliver a productive outcome, and for the time being, that meeting was postponed. That August cancellation was followed in mid-September by the summit in, Pyong in Pyongyang between President Moon and Chairman Kim, and not too long after that, Secretary Pompeo and myself at the United Nations General Assembly in New York had the opportunity to sit down with the Foreign Minister of North Korea, Ryung Ho, to continue the discussions we had had in Pyongyang and Singapore. After the meeting in New York, Secretary Pompeo received a new invitation to visit Pyongyang. And in early October, the Secretary and I flew to Pyongyang, where we conducted a day-long meeting with Chairman Kim Jong-un, with one of his senior advisors and his sister, Kim Yo-jong, and with Kim Young-chol, the senior official who was appointed to lead the discussions with the United States of America. I myself, uh, it was indicated that uh, uh, soon that we would be able to begin the working level negotiations and that my counterpart would be the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, Che Sani. After that October meeting, uh, we went into something of a holding pattern. Uh, as is often the case in the diplomatic process between the United States and North Korea, whether driven by internal considerations external disagreements, misunderstandings, misperceptions, we went into something of a holding pattern for nearly a two-month period. Very little contact between our two governments and very little sense of how we would be able to proceed as next steps. Again, not, uh, not, uh, not unknown in the course of diplomacy between the United States and North Korea. On a timetable uh, known only to the North Koreans, our engagement began anew around Christmas in 2018 and continued over the next two months with the most sustained period of engagement between the United States and North Korea in over a decade. During that period, we saw Chairman Kim give an important address on New Year's Day in which he reaffirmed his commitment both to the economic uh, development of his country and to complete denuclearization. Shortly after that, we played host to a visit from the senior representative of the North Korean government here in Washington, D.C., where we had a full-day meeting with Secretary of State Pompeo, as well as an extended Oval Office meeting where President Trump agreed and confirmed his willingness to hold a second summit meeting with Chairman Kim at the end of February in Vietnam. During that meeting, uh, really at the, be at the commencement of that meeting, I was introduced to a new counterpart. The North Koreans had selected a new person with whom we would negotiate demonstrating a seriousness that they were prepared to take in engaging in working level negotiations. And in fact, he and I seized the opportunity at that Washington meeting with a few spare hours on the afternoon before the delegation was due to depart to have our first substantive discussion where we framed out an agenda and a timetable that would allow us to work closely together in order to try to achieve the wishes of our two leaders before the Hanoi summit. I received an invitation to Pyongyang in early February, and I had the privilege of traveling there with a team of 15 tremendously talented and skilled American diplomats who serve on our negotiating team, experts in missiles and nuclear weapons, experts in sanctions and economics, experts in international law, and the many, many other issues that are included in this broad discussion between us and North Korea. 
We spent several days in Pyongyang in very productive discussions with our North Korean counterparts. Um, it would be an exaggeration or, or a, a mistake to, to describe that as a negotiation. What we took the opportunity to do is to speak candidly in an extended manner with each other on what the expectations of each side were in the course of these negotiations. It was a very informative session. We heard much from our North Korean counterparts. They heard much from us. And in our view, it positioned us very well for what was to follow. It was less than a month later that we rejoined that conversation in Hanoi, about a week before President Trump and Chairman Kim arrived to conduct their second leader level summit. In those several days of negotiations in advance of the summit, we had extended talks again, but this time discussions on specific initiatives and roadmaps and end states, shared goals, each national goals. I would say over the course of those several days, uh, the productivity of the discussions uh, is unsurpassed uh, during such a short time between uh, US and North Korean interlocutors. But there was one significant absence in the course of those meetings, which was that our North Korean counterparts were clearly not authorized or empowered to negotiate issues around denuclearization. And this presented us with something of a challenge because in the course of such negotiations, it was necessary for us to make progress on all the issues if we were able to move forward. It was clear in hindsight that these issues are such a, of such a sensitive nature and held so closely inside the North Korean government that it was the decision of the North Korean government to exclusively conduct that negotiation at the leader level when Chairman Kim arrived in Hanoi. And so our team and our counterparts put as much as we could into place on paper, laying out a set of areas where the two sides might be able to progress to fulfill the vision of the two leaders as described in the Singapore Joint Statement. And we moved to the leader level summit, which commenced shortly thereafter and focused almost exclusively on the area of denuclearization. Chairman Kim came with some proposals. Uh, President Trump uh, pressed him over the course of two days to understand better what the North Koreans' expectations were and also uh, to what they were willing to commit. And I will say over the course of those two days, the leaders learned quite a bit about each other. They learned quite a bit about each other's positions. The meetings were constructive, they were friendly, they were warm, and while they did not ultimately conclude with an agreement, in our view, it is far from the end of the diplomacy, and certainly as President Trump has emphasized many, many times, we are still open to continued negotiations to try to continue to narrow the gaps between our two countries. It is no secret that since Hanoi, the US-North Korean diplomacy has been in something of a holding pattern. In the past week, there's been an uptick in activity with President Trump receiving a letter from Chairman Kim with a meeting of senior officials from North and South Korea at Pumajan Village, and also with the agreement and announcement for a summit meeting between President Xi Jinping and Chairman Kim in Pyongyang beginning tomorrow. While we and the North Koreans have yet to resume our negotiations at the working level since the Hanoi summit, there have been numerous communications between our two governments, publicly and privately, directly, and through third parties. In the weeks after Hanoi, there was a significant policy pronouncement by Chairman Kim, which has been followed by more recent official statements and articles emphasizing various points. Not surprisingly, we have studied these carefully in order to understand the North Korean perspectives and positions, just as we know they have carefully studied our own. We have noted the ideas that are constructive and that could facilitate progress when our two countries resume working level negotiations. Both sides understand the need for a flexible approach. This is the only way to move forward in diplomacy. We understand that to find mutually beneficial solutions, we have to go beyond the formulas that for the past 25 years have failed to resolve this problem. We have made clear that the U.S. is looking for meaningful and verifiable steps on denuclearization. And we understand that in the North Korean view, this is possible, but needs to proceed in context 
with broader discussions of security guarantees and improved overall relations. In fact, this is not significantly different from what our two leaders have already said. As part of the Singapore summit commitments, President Trump agreed to provide security guarantees, and Chairman Kim reaffirmed his firm and unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization. In short, to regain our momentum in our negotiations, it would behoove us to go back to the first principles, that is, the four basic areas of agreement in the joint statement that came out of the Singapore summit, which I discussed a few moments ago. When we resume working level negotiations, the U.S. is prepared to discuss all the commitments our leaders made in Singapore. And in doing so, maybe, just maybe, we can make further progress on the vision President Trump and Chairman Kim expressed in their first meeting one year ago, building a lasting peace and security on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Well, thank you both uh, very, very much, A, for taking the time to be here at the Atlantic Council and, and uh, to offering those remarks on what I thought were both hopeful and aspirational for th some things to come. And it sounds to me like there's a little bit of activity that gives you both a little bit of optimism that something uh, uh, may happen in the next few days. Can you talk about the importance of President Xi's visit uh, and what that might mean for any dialogue with uh, when President Trump arrives in the, in the next week or so? Uh, let me uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman, and uh, I'll be happy to happy to address that. I've seen a lot of speculation and and press coverage over the couple days since the announcement was made, and I'd I'd caution everybody: uh, let's wait and see what the results are. Uh, as I said in my remarks, uh, we have forged a uh, pretty good partnership with China uh, in approaching the issues on the Korean Peninsula. I'm not Pollyannish about this, of course. Uh, the United States and, and China. I uh, have many areas of competition, many, many areas in, you know, of disagreement uh, in our policies and including in the, in the region of East Asia. But the way I've described it to people uh, in, in, uh, in, in how we've been able to work with China is that China agrees with us 100% some of the way. And it's, it's that some of the way that is, is essential here. China, the Chinese government, Wants, the, uh, wants to create the conditions for peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. The Chinese government uh, has many times said that it seeks the elimination of weapons of mass destruction from the Korean Peninsula. That's a good, that's a good enough uh, point for us and the Chinese uh, to agree. And the most important thing about this is that China is not doing this as a favor for the United States of America. This is China's national interests. And in this case, Chinese national interests and American national interests coincide. So that's a pretty durable foundation uh, for cooperation, and we have every expectation that, that President Xi will continue to send constructive but appropriate messages uh, during his meeting over the course of the next two days in Pyongyang. Well, I, I perfectly agree with uh, Steve. Um, I have, uh, I pinned down a great hope for the best outcome for the future negotiations on denuclearization. But I think to take uh, some historic approach, you know, Kim Jong Un, Chairman Kim Jong Un, had um, four time at f a summit with the uh, Chinese counterpart four times already. Every summit was followed by contacts with the United States. For for example, the first um, visit to uh, Beijing and the uh, summit, and it was uh, followed by Pre uh, Secretary Pompeo's visit in a few days' time. So maybe I I uh, hope that that the, this time again this pattern will apply. And the second thing is the um, the op-ed writing uh, uh, is contributed by the pre uh, by uh, pre President Xi, and he highlights uh, the economic development, and then the, the raise of a, a livelihood of the people, North Korean people, and the uh, diplomatic you know, the, the search for a diplomatic solution through dialogue. All these points are exactly shared by U.S. and South Korea and China. And as, uh, as uh, Steve has mentioned, uh, North, uh, the China has been uh, more or less on the same page. Well, it's completely on the same page. Um, I can say, safely say that. Well, so until now, some people are concerned about the possible <coughs> negative 
impact on um, on the denuclearization issue of the uh, deteriorating uh, problem, uh, deteriorating uh, the bilateral relations between China and the United States. But I beg to differ. This time, North China has been very constructive in its uh, playing of its role. So I still uh, trust that North in United uh, China will continue to play that role this time as well. Thank you. So with the, the security issues in the region have also been uh, a little bit contested over the last couple of years. Uh, the moving of the THAAD missile systems is, is might be one example. Has that had any impact uh, negatively on, on how you see China's role in dealing with the North Korean issue? Well, so th every country has a national, national security interest to protect, and uh, we are following that line as well. And at the same time, the, the role of diplomacy is to reconcile to differences of bi different countries and different interests. We have done that already. So um, I would uh, say that the United China is well aware that, that this North Korea nuclear issue is uh, something, something that should be uh, treated with a special interest, not uh, to not um, um, approached in the perspective of uh, different uh, issues on 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 uh, different and on the bilateral relations. For my part, I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't think we can isolate any single issue. The, uh, the steps that have been taken in the region that have roiled uh, the security situation, of course, at the very heart of this are the substantial level provocations that took place over 2016 and 2017 with the frequent testing of both nuclear weapons as well as uh, long range and intercontinental ballistic missiles. But I also, uh, and, and, and very much uh, the deployment of the THAAD uh, system uh, into South Korea uh, has to be seen in that context as a, a reaction and a response uh, to those, uh, to that uh, growing threat. Uh, but I will say that uh, while uh, it's frequent that I read and, and, and hear the frustration with the pace of the diplomacy and, and still the lack of, of the tangible results which we ourselves uh, very much want to see, uh, in this beyond, uh, beyond the very important steps that actually were taking place uh, when the two leaders met in, in Singapore. And, and I probably should pause a second to enumerate those, that those include the uh, absence of testing of, of intercontinental ballistic missiles over the course of the, uh, more than the past year. Likewise, nuclear weapons. Also, um, the very important return of 55 sets of remains from the Korean War. Uh, important, imp an imp important, important step in healing the wounds of war that we have seen uh, has allowed the United States to move forward and, and, and develop more normal relations with other countries around the world with, in, in which there have been conflicts in the past. Um, but aside from those steps, you know, we understand the, uh, the desire uh, to move further and faster, and we ourselves would like to have a lot more done already. But we shouldn't take for granted also the relative peace and stability that we've had in the region the past year. Um, I don't think anybody in this room needs to be reminded of the tensions that existed in 2016 and 2017. The very tensions and, and the very sense of crisis that thrust forward this diplomatic opportunity through the leadership of your president, President Moon, and ultimately and very importantly through the leadership of our president who has taken a completely new approach here in the United States to how we can resolve these issues on the Korean Peninsula. So as we think about provocations and we think about security threats and we think about uh, the continuing divisions uh, in East Asia and on the Korean Peninsula, we should never for a moment also take for granted uh, what, uh, what our leaders, uh, what our three leaders have been able to achieve uh, over the course of the past year. This is Washington, D.C., and it's always, what have you done for me today? Right. So that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's what you face uh, in your comments there. Uh, you talked about the, the Hanoi uh, summit. Uh, and you walked away, uh, according to both your statements, with a better understanding of what maybe uh, Kim's strategic goals and objectives might be in this. And there's some confusion in the analytic community about what those might be. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what you thought clarified, or the things that got clarified in those conversations for you all as you go into this next round of negotiation? Yeah, well, I think, I think that I think there are a few salutary uh, um, benefits that came out of that uh, meeting. Uh, first is that uh, the time the leaders spent together is time well spent. And uh, I, I, again, I want to emphasize that while the discussions didn't ultimately produce an extensive agreement, 
Um, those discussions were cordial and, and left open uh, opportunities for us to pursue it, many of the initiatives that we discussed at the working level uh, as we uh, meet again in the future. Um, it is uh, also uh, very beneficial uh, to have emphasized that for both countries, uh, denuclearization sits at the center of this discussion. Um, our expectations uh, have been made quite clear uh, to the North Koreans, but Chairman Kim has also signaled to us in the course of that meeting that how important this issue is to him and in, in, in the course of this diplomacy, our, our efforts are directed at changing the incentives and changing the security environment that led North Korea ultimately to decide to pursue weapons of mass destruction to begin with. Um, I think that we also benefit from that. I think another salutary effect, quite honestly, is that it underscored the necessity for sustained working level negotiations between our two sides. Without a doubt, the most important and unique element of this round of diplomacy between our countries is the leader level engagement. And, and Ambassador Lee addressed the top down, uh, importance of a top down approach in his remarks earlier, both in our system, which is a, a, a large and sprawling democracy with many voices and views. You know, ultimately, the President of the United States is gonna make the decisions that drive us forward with North Korea. But if that's the case in our system, it's many, many times more so in North Korea, where it's a very important that the direction of the, of the leader uh, is given so that the negotiators and the teams working on these issues have the room to, to navigate and explore uh, solutions. So I think it was beneficial in underlining that point that we just need to do a lot more work. And in fact, the negotiators, when they meet with us again, must be empowered to be able to negotiate on all of the issues. Uh, it's not enough for us to talk about transforming relations or advancing peace on the peninsula or the humanitarian issues we've discussed around the recovery of remains or other issues that could help heal the wounds of the Korean War 66 years ago. We also have to talk about denuclearization and that has to be something that the negotiators are prepared uh, in the next meeting that we have with them. Would, would that be a precondition to those meetings? No, it's, it's, but, it's, but it's definitely the pathway to success for us. Uh, we, we can't make enough progress without meaningful and verifiable steps on denuclearization. It's absolutely at the core of this. It's what, it's what produced this moment uh, to begin with. Now, that is not a condition, and, and let, me, let me say it will be met with equal vigor on our part to address in parallel all the other commitments that our two leaders made in Singapore. Uh, we are prepared uh, to embrace the, the full set of initiatives that our two leaders committed to, but we have to discuss all of it. To add to, to, add to what um, Steve had just said, I think the, the Hanoi summit was important on two counts. Number one was uh, two sides on the United States and North Korea had a, a time to exchange their views and their positions fully enough. But uh, the problem was that the, um, the positions got across to uh, the North Korean side was not maybe um, fully reported out there. At the number two, the importance of number two is that, um, a as uh, the Steve has just mentioned, the importance, we learned the lesson, the about the lessons, uh, about the importance of uh, working level negotiations. Well, so the, the, the leaders at the in Hanoi, when they met, met up, didn't have enough time to discuss all the details. Nitty gritties of all the details are very technical and very small things. And that should be ironed out. Those differences should be ironed out beforehand so that, that the leaders can um, uh, choose several from several options. I think that kind of pre um, the summit um, the consultations are in is called for more than ever than before, I think. That there weren't these pre-agreed conclusions, as happens many times in these very sensitive negotiations. Uh, do you believe that led up to the to uh, Chairman Kim storming off uh, back to North Korea? He certainly came with expectations that were not met in these negotiations. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a matter of fact, somebody may have paid with their life. There's certainly reports that he's either incarcerated or. Uh, some news reports say he was executed, one of the lead negotiators, uh, Kim Hyuk uh, Chol. Uh, apparently a job you don't want in North Korea. Uh, is that, uh, can you talk through a little bit about that? I mean, that certainly sends a message about to what his expectations were mm -hmm. versus what maybe our expectations were going into the Hanoi. So um, I spent uh, 
I spent uh, quite a bit of time yeah. with the North Korean negotiating team. I have to say that I found them uh, capable and prepared on the issues in which they had authority to discuss. They were, they were effective in, in communicating their wishes, and, and I hope we were effective in communicating ours. The fact that we didn't reach an agreement in Hanoi, uh, I agree completely with Ambassador Lee, uh, isn't a failure. Uh, but it, uh, it wasn't our preferred outcome either, of course, but it wasn't a failure. And it, the, the process is very much uh, still remains the case. I wouldn't uh, agree with the characterization that Chairman Kim stormed away from Hanoi. Uh, he remained in Hanoi for a couple days uh, for a very productive visit on his own right, in his own right, with the uh, leaders of Vietnam, who have been, by the way, uh, tremendous partners for us in trying to create the openings uh, for diplomacy. And we owe a great word of thanks uh, to the Vietnamese government for playing host to that very important summit. Uh, the, uh, as far as the accounts of uh, what has happened inside North Korea with the negotiating team uh, since, we don't know. And, and, I, and, I, and I think I, I would tend to think a little bit uh, of that is overblown, but part of it is driven by the fact that, that, that so much that happens inside uh, North Korea is, is opaque to us. Um, I will say that uh, uh, we, we, of course, uh, wish no ill on anybody um, you know, at a certain level. We are all uh, working very hard on behalf of our countries to do our job, and uh, I will do that for the United States of America, and I would expect nothing less uh, of them. Um, but going forward, uh, you know, this isn't, uh, it, there's been several shifts in personnel and shovel, several uh, uh, changes in, in how the North Koreans are prepared to engage, engage us, and that's ultimately their decision. We will engage whoever they put across uh, from us at the table, as, as uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has said before. But I also want to emphasize <coughs> that the door is wide open uh, to negotiations, and we expect and hope uh, that in the not too distant future, uh, we will be re-engaged in this process in a substantive way. President Trump has said on a number of occasions that he has full confidence that Chairman Kim will fulfill the commitments he made uh, to the president in Singapore. Our job is to, to continue to work with whoever the North Koreans put across the table from us uh, to be able to realize that vision. Representative Lee. Well, there's some, uh, reports about the fate that uh, our um, North Korean counterparts had to face. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, setting aside the authenticity of the report, I, I want to join us, um, especially Representative Began, in um, emphasizing that every, every negotiators are trying to protect their national interest. And uh, I will do the same, actually, and in, the, in the future negotiations. The most important thing is the level of uh, communications, level of uh, communications between negotiators, level of uh, communications between the negotiator and the, their leaders. And I think that kind of a uh, negotiation, the fluent and the very f um, good negotiation level would bring us more progress than before. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, certainly we communicated with each other and we communicate our um, leaders very well. But um, now it is time for North Korea to think more about how to move process forward and uh, facilitate uh, their communications within them. I'm sure they, uh, we understand that, that North Korea is uh, undergoing some kind of policy review of the Hanoi, and uh, now they have come to conclusion that um, if they really want to make progress on denuclearization and then the, you know, garnering the, uh, the securing the corresponding measures in return, they need to um, be, they need to have a new approach to this issue. And what would that new approach look like for you? <laughs> that would be, um, well, the, the first, in the first place, the United States and North Korea should meet together at the working level. And then the, we, they need to you know, continue their uh, original discussions about their positions. And the, yeah. Can I bail you out a little bit on this one? Yeah. Let me also sure say, let, let me also <laughs> say, um, uh, uh, that Ambassador Lee and I are engaged in an extraordinarily sensitive diplomatic endeavor right now. And while uh, answering questions and illuminating uh, 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 the audience and the observers is very important, I think Ambassador Lee and I both know uh, that every word that we say is poured over um, in Pyongyang and we want to we want to be very careful in uh, and the messages we send. Uh, uh, Congressman, you asked me earlier if we were setting any conditions and we are not. Um, what we are trying to do is achieve the vision that our two leaders have already agreed to. That's our job. And, and, and there's a lot of give and take that will need to take place in the months ahead if we're going to be successful in that. 
So I don't mean to cut you off, uh, Ambassador Lee, but, but I think, uh, you know, for my part, I, I worry here in the United States about, about us um, sharing too much where we want to go. The, the North Koreans need to hear that from us, but I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to add that two cents worth. We were talking aspirational, weren't yeah. we? I think that's what we were talking about. Yeah. Is, is, has there been any progress on any of the points coming out of Singapore? Do you, th do you feel that they've made some progress toward those goals and, and, and joint agreed uh, options going forward? Yeah. Well, I, I, I enumerated some of the ag agreements, uh, some of the uh, progress that we saw in the aftermath of, of, of Hanoi including uh, not only um, uh, the moratorium that they've put in place, in, excuse me, out of Singapore, uh, the moratorium that they'd put in place even before Singapore on further testing of ICBMs and further testing of ballistic missiles uh, uh, that, uh, that were so provocative uh, during that period. We've seen some recent tests, obviously, that reach a level of uh, concern for us, uh, and uh, I will fully acknowledge that. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, we're continuing to, uh, to watch closely, but with, uh, with some sense of assurance that uh, North Korea has decided not to, to take the steps that would that ultimately create real problems in, in preserving the space for diplomacy. The absence of nuclear tests as well, of course, is significant. The, um, the uh, apparent abandonment of the facility at Pungeri where these nuclear tests occurred. Um, we've seen uh, some backsliding in, in in uh, Sohei or Tongchangri, the site where uh, space launch vehicles and, and, and uh, missile engines had been tested, but they have, that facility hasn't been utilized. And of course, we saw the remains uh, return of 55 soldiers uh, from, uh, uh, who, who fell in the Korean War, which again, uh, isn't, isn't necessarily often described as the centerpiece of the discu this discussion, but having myself been involved in, in and transformative of moments with other countries. And these are the small steps that actually uh, yield the greatest dividends. And, and they're very important to creating uh, a societal support for the policies that we're seeking uh, to do between the two countries. So um, the, the progress, uh, I, I will be the first to say the progress has not been as much as uh, we would have liked. And we have a lot more to do. Um, but at the same time, the opportunity is still there, and uh, and and our job is to to try to deliver that for our two leaders. Right. Well, as um, special representative of Pigano, uh, at the outset mentioned that there is no conflict, no tension at the moment on the Korean Peninsula. I think that, that is a great feat in itself. And the number two is with the all, all the parties concerned are very much you know, eager to continue negotiations. They never said that, that we do not want to engage with anymore. And the United States and North Korea, South Korea, and China, Russia, everyone, and the international community behind us as well, are supporting the idea of a continued engagement. I think that uh, the habit or the culture of engagement is a very important thing that has been established over the years. Even if you look, up, look back on the, the previous 10 years, there was nothing much actually. There was only a sanctions you know, imposed on North Korea without necessarily bringing about any, any results or any progress. But now, over the last two, less than two years, we have made a great progress. There is, maybe it is, we, we might call it a temporary, but, but, but still there is a peace there. And there is a habit of engagement and talking to each other. Although there is a, some, you know, there is a the stalemate after Hanoi, but still we talk about talking. So that, I think that is the most important thing we have just you know, achieved over the, lap, uh, the short period, of two months, two years. I, I do think it's an impressive accomplishment, as you talked about, that uh, opening the door of dialogue to getting into the room of the solution. And if you've inculcated that culture of we are going to continue talks, I think you've done miraculous work already. So congratulations to you both. I think we have time for one question. Is that, am I getting that right? Maybe one question. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you could tell us uh, whether there is any agreed common definition of what CVID are complete, verifiable, and uh, irreversible denuclearization means. 
uh, was there any progress in Hanoi at defining a common definition? That's a great question. So great question, by the way. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and, and let me thank Congressman Rogers and the Atlantic Council again uh, for hosting us in the East Asia Foundation, Minister Kim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think you can tell uh, from this discussion uh, the closeness uh, with which we and um, our allies in the Republic of Korea work. And in fact, even though I was uh, in the negotiations uh, with the U.S. team over the course of those several days in Hanoi, I could defer uh, to Ambassador Lee to answer this question because um, we, have, uh, we have complete transparency with our allies in South Korea on everything we're doing in order to try to advance our shared interests. On your question, though, uh, which I will answer, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you properly highlight what we consider to be one of the most important starting uh, areas of agreement between us and the North Koreans. The only thing we have in, in common to go from is what was agreed to in the, uh, in the joint statement at Singapore, which commits the uh, two countries to taking steps to achieve the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. There have been many definitions of what that means shared uh, both in North Korea and here in the United States of America, and we ourselves do have a, a, a very clear view on what that should entail. Uh, it is an area that we spent uh, time discussing with our North Korean uh, counterparts in Hanoi, um, but nothing was agreed to in Hanoi, and so anything that we've discussed, uh, uh, I, I should treat uh, still as remaining somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat in process, and, and I'd rather not comment extensively on that in public. I will say that uh, that we feel this is very important. Of course. Uh, uh, North Korea will ha have a say in this as well, the North Korean delegation, and it's a subject which we look forward to bringing up again. But for present, we don't have that agreed definition of what denuclearization is, and we do consider that to be a, a very important starting point. We'll never get to our destination if we don't know where we're going. And so it's very important for us up front to agree on what that destination is. Well, there are different definitions of um, uh, the, the end state of denuclearization, uh, but uh, we the best starting point is a complete denuclearization. That between uh, the two leaders of South and North Korea has agreed on the term complete denuclearization, and uh, the President Trump and the Chairman Kim also agreed on the term complete denuclearization. I think the the complete denuclearization is uh, all encompassing uh, the concept, and we can start from there. Right. Well, on behalf of uh, the Atlantic Council and the East Asia Foundation, thank you very, very much. We know how busy you are. We know how important the work that you do is. Uh, and as two former military guys, a guy who served uh, his government as well, we understand that diplomacy may be the most courageous work uh, that happens. And thank you very, very much for the work. How about a big round of applause for our two diplomats? <laughs> Solving the world's problems.
Well, why don't we uh, get started with our first panel discussion on seeking a post-Hanoi breakthrough. I thought that first uh, set of remarks was really, really interesting. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, this is a very important time for uh, the future process related to uh, peace and security uh, in, on the Korean Peninsula and indeed around, around the region more broadly. And so I think the key question we're going to turn to our really expert panelists here to answer is, how do we restart this thing in an effective way? What's the, what's the way forward? Before we begin, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. To my left, we have His Excellency Young Dae Kim. He's a member of the Korean National Assembly, and he's head of the Justice Party's Foreign Affairs and Security Division. He also serves as a member of the National Assembly's National Defense Committee. And before serving in the National Assembly, he worked as a policy advisor to the Minister of Defense. So an enormous amount of expertise on defense issues, which is central to these questions. Um, we also have uh, a familiar face here at the Atlanta Council and on television screens in Washington, Ambassador Joseph Yoon. Uh, Ambassador Yoon served as the Special Envoy on North Korea from 2016 to 2018. He's considered one of the nation's leading experts on relations with North Korea. He also served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2011 to 2013. He currently serves as a special advisor to the Asia program at the U.S. Institute for Peace. To his left, we're honored to also have Her Excellency Jae Jung Lee. Ms. Lee is a member of the, also a member of the Korean National Assembly, and she is a spokesperson for the Democratic Party of Korea. She also serves as a member of the Special Committee on Inter-Korean Economic Cooperation which we have heard a little bit about as also one of the key work streams in these processes, uh, as well as the Special Committee on the Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the Public Administration and Security Committee. Last but not least, we have Dr. Toby Dalton. Dr. Dalton is the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before working at Carnegie, he worked at the U.S. Department of Energy from 2002 to 2010, serving as the acting director for the Office of Nuclear Safeguards and Security and senior policy advisor to the Office of Nonproliferation and International Security. And the way we'll run uh, this discussion, which will end promptly at 12.30, I will ask each of our uh, esteemed panelists to offer their initial remarks, roughly five to seven minutes. Uh, once we hear from all of them, I might ask a couple of questions because I'm a very curious moderator. Uh, and then we really want to engage you. So um, uh, shortly after I ask a couple of questions, please start um, mm -hmm. thinking of questions that you want to raise. We want to have a conversation. We want to come out of this conversation with insights that can help to move the ball forward, as I said earlier. So please start thinking of your questions. Um, I think with that, uh, I will turn right now to uh, Mr. Kim. So thank you, Mr. Kim for coming, and Mr. Kim will speak in Korean, so please use your headphones if you do not speak Korean. 네, 감사합니다. Uh, 저는 대한민국 국회의원 김정배입니다. Assemblyman uh, in the Republic of Korea. My thanks goes to Mr. Operator, uh, 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 facilitator rather. The stand made between the North and the United States, how can we break through? There is much discussion. Even today, we heard. But how a uh, conversation should uh, take place only when we understand why this stalemate began in the first place. I think that's very, very important. In actuality, the current stalemate is being prolonged. Of course, we really got to acknowledge that the stalemate will continue for some time. Nevertheless, well, I think there will be some improvement, but it is going on at this, uh, at least for the time being, because there is so much uh, emphasis on the ultimate end state, which is denuclearization. Let me just give you one illustration. Uh, God forbid one person has a, a cancer, but the end state is complete healing from cancer so that you can go back home in one piece. That's your end state goal, right? 
But if this cancer is verifiable and irreversible and to be healed completely, that is my end state goal as a cancer patient. However, that doesn't necessarily mean just because there is no guarantee that you can attain that end state goal, are you going to give up on all the processes for treatment and therapies? No, you really got to try it anyhow before and until you reach that end state goal. Your cancer may stay, but you really got to do something to, in the mid phase, including how you really want to fight the cancer, your mentality, your mindset, your lifestyle, all those mid-stage uh, concepts need to be in place, but not so for our conversation regarding our goal to denuclearize the North. Do we have CVID? We are so stuck up with this end state goal at the risk of forgetting about the end uh, mid stage steps that are much, much needed. They are not clearly defined, and the end stage goal, when it's not clearly defined, I think mid stage uh, uh, steps need to be taken, and that can be applied and better understood when we think about much need for taking steps to heal the cancer. We really need to remove two obstacles and want to uh, suggest three steps for healing. First of all, the first obstacle is obsession with big deal or a one deal. In fact, denuclearization of the nodes should be understood as a process as opposed to one package deal. Therefore, we need to be more flexible, taking into account some mid steps. We need to uh, change our mindset. That's my first uh, prescription. And the second uh, set of suggestion is that uh, that uh, that you got to punish the bad behavior of the North uh, is a prerequisite. We need to get away with that. Of course, that is a principle that we really got to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. However, economic sanction, is it the proper punishment, I think we need to give much consideration about the propriety of this me uh, measure. If you continue with the sanction and pressure, as some school of thought continues to suggest, based upon their continued bad behavior and they, they have inherent bad intent, which can be met only by strong punishment, according to their uh, uh, perceived view. However, humanitarian disaster is the reality uh, the ongoing reality of North Korea, uh, uh, famine and the spread of infectious disease and lack of commodities for their basic livelihood is going to explode and may cause some humanitarian disaster in the North. And if that becomes a reality, they will only end up sh uh, strengthening their internal uh, grip and their uh, uh, dicta dictatorship will be strengthened and this will only this serve, uh, work as a disservice to the uh, stability in the region. So the punishment to the North, is it going to uh, uh, make contribution to uh, further stability in the area? I don't think so. So if you really idolize sanction as the only available tool, I think we need to reconsider this kind of a mentality. That is my suggestion to remove the second obstacle. And what are the positive uh, options for healing? Three of them. I would like to suggest today. First, between North Korea and South Korea and the United States, between our three nations, we got to pursue cooperative uh, denuclearization instead of trying to coerce one party to take certain action and uh, uh, yield. Rather, we really got to make sure that all parties involved to enhance cooperation through what I would call cooperative denuclearization, that is the first healing agent, and the second agent for healing is uh, progressive and gradual. The complete uh, denuclearization, as uh, Special Representative Began uh, uh, mentioned, that even between the North and the United States haven't come to an agreement. And I agree, because it is impractical almost to come to an agreement. So in that sense, I think denuclearization should be seen as a process, not as a end state goal. And it can be only properly approached through gradual steps. And the third healing agent is comprehensive. Of course, in the process, the degree of trust between Washington and Pyongyang can 
improve and exchanges can improve as well. And in actuality, denuclearization will translate to mean improved relationship between the United States and the North. So instead of being hung up on one value, which is denuclearization, if you can broaden our perspective and see the benefit that comes from broadened coexistence and peace and greater possibility for co-prosperity, I think it will be a, a, a positive side effect. So if we come up with the summary of all these three healing agents, which is a cooperative, gradual, and comprehensive denuclearization. What do I mean by that? Yes, it would be great if you can be healed overnight, but even if that is not the immediate likelihood, but if you continue to sustain strong hope for eventual healing, and you do your best what, about what you can do as a patient, and you build a, a trust, covenantal, contractual, uh, trust between the patient and the doctor, I think this will go a long way toward eventual healing. So cooperative relationship and denuclearization as a process along the way, if that becomes a, a framework, just because we haven't come to the desired goal between Washington and Pyongyang, it's because we have been hung up on achieving the end state goal not understanding the mid steps that were much needed and falling short of coming up with what is tangible and possible uh, to be offered along the way to the north. So I think in that sense, we really got to foster and create an environment that is conducive to uh, 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 helping North Korea come along and move along that way. In that sense, I agree, or rather the points by Mr. Lee and Mr. Began, I think I would like to hope that they basically agree with my view. So the first session was very, very refreshing and very encouraging. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've learned a lot more about uh, health care than I expected to so far. But I actually do want to come back to you on uh, some of your thoughts. I think I really heard emphasis on trust, on, on medium steps on the way to the goal, and on softer tools. Uh, and I have lots of questions, and I'm sure you do about that as well. But now let's turn to Ambassador Yoon to hear his thoughts, please. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, it's good to be here, see so many familiar faces, especially Foreign Minister Kim uh, and my former boss, Sandy Vershbaugh, you know. It's good life after government service, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, I wanted to make four points, you know, in, in thinking about how we restart or make some progress. I think the first point I want to make is that actually next two weeks, I believe, will be quite important. Uh, we have summit diplomacy coming up. We have uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping going to China. He will then go to Osaka in for G20 to meet with President Trump <coughs> as well as others. So you have to believe that foremost uh, in, on the mind of Chinese President is uh, number one problem is of course the trade war between US and China. And his second issue is going to be where he is, which is how to deal with North Korea problem. I think so that is very much, I believe, it will be at least not explicitly, explicitly, but implicitly linked in his mind. And so those will be his two priorities. On the mind of President Trump is, uh, are three priorities. Number one priority is how does he get reelected in 2020? Uh, second, more immediate one meeting with Xi Jinping is does he draw out the trade war with China? And third is, of course, what to do about North Korea. Luckily for Xi Jinping, you see, those, they, two, they have two similar problems. Uh, luckily for Xi Jinping, he doesn't have a re-election problem, you know? So, so I think f from that point of view, what can be worked out between the two I really do believe trade war will take priority. And then second, it will be North Korea. So they will be in back of their mind, how can we cooperate on trade war? What is our leverage with North Korea? 
and what is, you know, how do we enter to put more pressure on each other using North Korea as a card. The second point I wanted to make was that for President Trump, this has been very successful. He sees it as a success. He sees it as his signature foreign policy move. And you can see that every time, even with setbacks, he says something, whether it's on tweet, Twitter or whether it's in a big forum, he creates more space for people like Steve Began and anyone else. That he wants engagements, he wants a deal. Of course, he is disappointed what happened in Hanoi, but I think he still wants a deal. I do think same can be said for Kim Jong-un by what we can see. There is a degree of wanting a deal, degree of disappointment, deep disappointment, that he did not get a deal in, in Hanoi. So those two want a deal, you know? So that, I think, is a starting point. Assuming things go reasonably well with Xi Jinping's visit and his meeting with Kim Jong-un, his meeting with Donald Trump, and given that both Kim Jong-un and uh, Donald Trump want a deal, deal, what might a deal look like? That's my third point. And this is where I very much agree with Representative Kim. I don't think you can expect a one go complete denuclearization and everything deal. That's completely unrealistic. And that's not what I think people are working towards. Rather, I think the starting point should be what was on the table in Hanoi. And in Hanoi, actually, there was a lot on the table. We had, you know, uh, uh, virtually agreed to open liaison offices. There was wide degree of agreement on how to deal with security issues, such as end of war declaration. Uh, there was, so the, the main thing, of course, they did not agree was how much denuclearization for how much sanctions. So as you can see, there is a deal on the table and this is uh, what I believe, what many people call Hanoi plus Alpha. And what does Alpha might look like? I think on the US side, I think if they get all of Yongbyon plus something like a definition of denuclearization, remember we have never received, at, at least on this round, a satisfactory definition of denuclearization. You know, something that is similar to six-party talks definition of denuclearization, I think that would be acceptable. Second thing uh, the plus alpha could consist of would be something like a roadmap. I think if you had a roadmap, you know, beginning with uh, what they have agreed to already, which is uh, end of, end of uh, uh, end of joint exercise, end of testing, going towards a freeze, going towards dismantlement, and so on. It's a very obvious roadmap. Uh, then I do think that would be enough. On the American side, in order to satisfy North Koreans, there has to be some give on sanctions. And again, contours of that is fairly obvious. You do partial lifting on coal exports you do partial lifting on oil imports. So I think those would, would be what I would call alpha that could get to what uh, Representative Kim talked about, which is kind of a, you know, what you might want to call interim deal. So that was my third point, that I think summits could open up these aspects. My last point is that in order to get to true de denuclearization, which at best will take long, long time, you need a process. And this is where, again, I think an interim deal could end up with a viable process that take you step by step, including implementation and getting to core issues like security assurances, economic assistance, you know, uh, normalization, so you need that process. And there are many ways you can cut that process. 
six party talks was a good process. Agreed framework was also a good process. I think one thing we haven't tried seriously is what I would call you know, a broadening beyond the bilateral at the moment between US and North Korea to include you know, key parties. And I would count certainly uh, South Korea and China as one. So broadening those talks to get there. So I do think there is a way. I mean, the real problem is that we're not going to get there quickly. But I think if you have a process, you can reduce tensions, and we can be on our way. So I must say I'm a relatively optimistic that with high-level engagement, we could get somewhere. Thank you, Barry. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Yun. And if I could just ask you to clarify your last mm -hmm. thought. Are you suggesting broadening talks right now to include China and I, South Korea, so four-party talks going forward? I, I would very much like to see broadening uh, either right now or immediately after a small in interim deal. I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, very specific suggestions which we'll want to discuss. And now we would um, welcome hearing from Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, thank you very much. Yes, I am a female member of the National Assembly. Uh, from the perspective of gender equality, Hey, I would like to make a contribution uh, to addressing the North Korean nuclear issue. And by expanding uh, female participation in the National Assembly, uh, I would like to make a small contribution. And uh, together with many female members of the audience today, uh, it is a great honor uh, for me to be able to talk about the North Korean issue today. Ultimately, we will be addressing peace in Asia and peace in the world. In order to talk about post-Hanoi summit, I believe that we need to look at the past negotiations with North Korea. In terms of history, I believe that it is teaching us that we cannot waste an opportunity for peace and stability. Uh, in 1994, during the Clinton administration, there was the agreed framework. Uh, but until the agreed framework was broken, uh, North Korea has not produced any fissile materials, nuclear materials. But in 2002, the Bush administration attacked North Korea for starting a highly enriched uranium program, a claim that the North Korean authorities denied. And in that process, uh, rather than engaging in negotiations and talks, uh, the Bush administration broke the Geneva Agree agreed the framework. And in response to that, North Korea expelled IAEA inspectors and withdrew from the NPT and went back to making nuclear weapons. And we are again standing at the crossroads. I believe that this is the last opportunity for us. And comparing now to back then, there are several differences. As was mentioned by Representative Lee and Special Representative Began. Um, some of the points are overlapping, but uh, let me just put them in my own words. First of all, the level of the North Korean nuclear threat is different. The nuclear technology they have is different from the one that, we, that they had in the past. So there is definitely a change in that aspect, and time is not on the side of the international community. And at the same time, the North Korea's foreign policy decision-making process is different from the past. Uh, in the case of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, they mostly depended on their political power. But now, the current leader of North Korea in 2018 uh, convened the third full session of the Workers' Party Central Committee meeting, and they officially discarded the policy of parallel pursuit of economy and nuclear development and decided economic development as the party's policy goal. Of course, uh, the top leader's role is still important in the system of North Korea. Nonetheless, in consideration of a socialist country's general decision-making process, when making a shift in foreign policy directions, the official nature of a party decision cannot be viewed lightly. And both the U.S. and North Korea are uh, 
expressing their willingness to engage in negotiations once again after Hanoi, as was mentioned by Special Representative Began today. Anyways, I believe that it is encouraging that both sides are not seeing the collapse of the Hanoi summit as the end of the dialogue. And given the uh, firm structure that North Korea seems to have in decision-making process, I, I believe that uh, there could be brighter uh, uh, prospects for uh, resumed negotiations. And I believe that uh, there has been the top-down approach that's been applied uh, to the process. And I believe that that carries uh, significance uh, in a country like North Korea. And there has been a change in the role played by the South Korean government. In the past, a South Korean government's role was secondary and dependent. But now, President Moon government's role is no longer like that because we're playing a much more central role now. And because of this changed role that's being played by South Korea, Chairman Kim Jong-un and President Trump could now have more stable relationship between themselves. And if we lose this opportunity once again, another 17 years what might have to pass before we seize an another opportunity for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And from the same perspective, after the Hanoi summit, President Moon Jae-in visited Washington and had a summit meeting with President Trump. And I believe that there was consensus reached during the summit meeting. Of course, some people were saying that uh, talking with North Korea was futile, but uh, that was not the case. And both the presidents uh, had the same view on that. And regarding the additional sanctions. Uh, they thought that the the sanctions, the additional sanctions were no were not really necessary. That the existing sanctions were sufficient. I believe that we need to start solving problems uh, from that point uh, that was reached, the consensus that was reached between the two leaders. North Korea are fun raising fundamental issues. There is now more at stake. Since 2016, uh, Pyongyang uh, is demanding lifting of five UN Security Council sanctions. And uh, of course, there's a controversy as to whether they're calling for full lifting of the sanctions or the partial lifting of the sanctions. But I believe that such controversy is meaningless because uh, if you look at uh, what has taken place inside North Korea, uh, they have been uh, talking about the security they have been calling for denuclearization and security guarantee. And apart from the controversy regarding their demands to the full lifting of the sanctions, post Hanoi, I believe that the game has been upped, that more has been put at stake in the game because North Korea is now demanding more than they used to demand before. And the U.S. might have to pursue this process in a phased manner, maybe through the uh, comments made by Representative Vigan. Um, maybe he was touching upon uh, such possibility of gradual approach. Maybe that's the insight that they've gained. And regarding the Kaesong Industrial Complex, uh, during the New Year's address by Kim Jong-un, they have already made an announcement. If uh, we can utilize a snapback uh, concept, because this is something that the US government can definitely utilize, I believe that if the US cannot do it by itself, then uh, you can utilize the South Korean government. For instance, uh, give South Korean government an opportunity to engage in economic cooperation with North Korea, and if uh, South Korea can do that uh, with uh, the uh, agreement of the U.S., then the North would uh, view that as a favorable gesture uh, on the part of the U.S. So utilizing the South Korean government is definitely something that I think the U.S. government can consider. Uh, you can use the South Korean government. And at the same time, 
I would like to also make a request to the U.S. government as the following, because the U.S. is sending mixed messages. John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, and Stephen Began are all telling different stories. And in trying to interpret their messages, a lot of time is invested. Now, the U.S. needs to send clear messages to North Korea. And at the moment, messaging is ambiguous. And should we rely on President Trump's tweeting for interpretation? I believe that we need to stop doing that. As we try to assess the Hanoi summit, uh, some people tend to believe that the Beacon approach was initially taken, but it was overturned by the Bolton approach, which is quite a funny uh, commentary, in my opinion. If this is not the strategy of the U.S. government, then you need to send a more clear message, because that would definitely make the North Korean government less confused, because I myself was quite confused. And I also would like to make some additional comments regarding the declaration of the end of war. Uh, two years ago, a lot of people uh, seem to believe uh, that the threat, the possibility, the risk of a war was triggered by the North Korean nuclear crisis two years ago. But that is not true. The truth of the matter is that the Korean Peninsula has been incessantly exposed to the threat of a war during almost the entire span of the past seven decades. The Korean War was temporarily paused with a ceasefire in 1953, and the armistice agreement recommended that in order to discuss a permanent resolution of the war, a political meeting be convened within three months of the signing. But 60 years have already passed. Still, no such meeting has been convened. Uh, without a peace treaty, the Korean War is still ongoing, and an active battle could be resumed any time. Uh, this was the source of conflicts on the Korean Peninsula and what made North Korea nuclear armed. Uh, therefore, if we are to take the road to peace, we must officially put an end to the war by doing something that we're supposed to do 66 years ago. Thank you. That, that, that was fantastic, Ms. Lee. Uh, I have lots of um, thoughts and questions for you, but I think the only thing that's less achievable than CVID is asking President Trump not to tweet. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but. Uh, a lot of really important points. This is a historic opportunity. I do want to come back to you later on your initial thought that time is not on the international community side. I think time is a major factor here. But uh, let me turn to Dr. Dalton to round out our initial uh, thoughts, and then we'll have a co conversation here. Dr. Sure. Dalton? Thanks very, and, and thanks to the Atlantic Council and the East Asia Foundation for convening us at this uh, important moment. Uh, I want to offer six observations about the post-Hanoi narrative here in Washington and then relate those to a couple of thoughts about the, the potential for a breakthrough going forward. First, to pick up on a, a comment that uh, uh, Ms. Lee just made about the kind of ambiguity of U.S. messaging, I think that a lot of the post-Hanoi narrative in Washington was shaped more by the desire of the White House to burnish President Trump's credentials as a tough negotiator than it was about anything uh, inherent to the negotiations. And you see this, in fact, in statements from Senate Democrats praising President Trump. You know, Senator Schumer, not exactly a fan of President Trump, said afterwards, President Trump did the right thing by walking away and not cutting a poor deal for the sake of a photo op. So part of the, the post hanoi narrative here is really about U.S. domestic politics, less about the deal itself. But it also relates to the uh, inherently subjective criteria for what makes a deal good or bad. And that actually, I think, in terms of a breakthrough, may present some opportunities some flexibility for President Trump if he decides that the deal is good enough to go ahead and sell it uh, and be satisfied. Second observation, if you look uh, at US demands over time, uh, there seems to be a little bit more realism creeping in. First, uh, in 2018, it was all, we need all of the nuclear weapons right now. And then it became, well, we need some of the nuclear weapons up front. And then it seemed to become, well, we'd settle for a comprehensive declaration. And then it became the big deal, which was less than all of those things. And I think here, if, if the intention is to prove that Kim Jong-un is not sincere about his desire to commit to, to full denuclearization, which is, you know, I think there are questions there, then making unmeetable demands up front is the way to prove that. 
If you want to test his sincerity, on the other hand, then the demands need to be staggered and progressive. I, I take a small glimmer of hope from the previous panel that there seems to be a desire uh, and a recognition that flexibility uh, is necessary to make progress. Third, we've already heard a lot of discussion about the need to define the end state. And it's clear that that definition is, is a roadblock. Personally, I don't think it needs to be a roadblock. There are multiple possible end states, all of which are preferable to the current situation. And we can make progress towards those without specifying every single related detail up front. Fourth, there was a, a, a statement made by a, an unnamed US official immediately after the Hanoi summit. Uh, and I'll read the statement. The statement was to give sanc extensive sanctions relief without a complete freeze on North Korea's weapons program would effectively put the US in a position of subsidizing Pyongyang's arms development. This is a really important statement. Uh, first of all, it's not a true statement. US giving sanctions relaxation uh, or waivers doesn't mean that the US is paying for North Koreans' nuclear weapons. But what it does say clearly is that what we really ought to care about is stopping further development first before then figuring out how to reverse it. Uh, Ambassador uh, Kim, uh, sorry, uh, Representative Kim earlier gave a, a cancer analogy. I prefer car analogies, so let me give a car analogy. If you're driving a car and you shift it into reverse while you're still driving forward, you will wreck the car, right? You first have to put it in neutral and stop, right? And then you can go backwards. Uh, fifth observation, I think the heavy focus on Yongbyon is really problematic for a couple reasons. Yes, it is central and continues to be central to North Korea's nuclear weapons program, but it has become less critical over time as you have additional uranium enrichment facilities outside of Yongbyon, as you have missile facilities outside of Yongbyon. Uh, and so making Yongbyon such a key focus makes it kind of impossible to evaluate and agree on the, the, uh, the value of it. Is it 90% of the program? Is it 50% of the program? That makes for a bad bargaining framework in my view. Related to that is a perception here in the US, again, a domestic political consideration that the US does not want to be suckered into buying the Yongbyon facility for a third time, right? Twice already we have purchased that reactor. Twice North Korea has reversed course uh, and that reactor at uh, Yongbyon has continued to operate. So that means that the deal has to be different. My sixth point, and related to that, and, and, and Ambassador Yoon mentioned this a little bit, is about the, the plus alpha. And there's been lots of speculation about what the plus alpha is or was after Hanoi. Was it an HEU facility, maybe one at, at a place called Bongang? Was it a list of scientists? Was it chemical and biological weapons? I don't know. Personally, I think this, is, this kind of speculation isn't particularly helpful because it masks what is uh, a much kind of more fundamental point, uh, which is that this is bargaining behavior, right? This is, this is the US saying, you need to give us a little bit more in order to, to cut this deal. It's like going, to, to make a different analogy, uh, when you go to the market, uh, in Korea and, and you're sort of bargaining with somebody and you know like you get to the end and you say chum kakuchu sale right like just give me a little bit more and then we can make this deal and I think that's what this message is so don't focus so much on the specifics focus more on kind of the bargaining framework that, that comes with that all right what does that mean for a breakthrough I think there's two types of breakthroughs that are necessary here one is about North Korea and one is about the US the, the one about North Korea is that to get m into a negotiation, I think we need a broader negotiating framework that creates more trade space around denuclearization. And I don't mean the other parts uh, of the Singapore summit. What I mean is uh, going back to this very narrow focus on Yongbyon is too restrictive, right? If you focus on facility or activity specific uh, things, uh, it will be difficult to come to an agreement. If you focus more broadly on principles, then I think it easier, it's easier to get past the issue of Yongbyon or the declaration or the end state. So four things that could be worked on. Number one, transparency. Uh, it need not be comprehensive up front. Uh, it could be a partial declaration, for instance, about uh, the amount of fissile material, the numbers of missiles. Uh, it could be subsequently uh, accompanied by in kinds of inspections over time. Uh, second type uh, of uh, principle is uh, cessation of work. 
North Korea has already stopped doing some things. Uh, it can be good to extend and expand the freeze on weapons-related activities. Um, fuel cycle is an obvious category where North Korea could stop work. Obviously, this would be more meaningful if it was accompanied by some inspection or monitoring uh, provisions. Um, but even a commitment alone to extend the freeze deeper into the nuclear weapons program uh, would be valuable. Third principle would be closures, uh, concrete physical actions at facilities. Um, we've seen a little bit uh, of this at the Sohei uh, missile test facility. Uh, similar kinds of activities where concrete actions are taken at some facilities uh, to create some costs to reverse them, I think could be important. Uh, and then finally, on the issue of the roadmap, it's clearly one of the US goals, and it's tied, again, to this end state definition. Um, but even without a roadmap that sort of has points in a line, you can identify steps that have to be done. You can disagree on the sequencing. You can disagree on uh, kind of the, the route to get to them um, or the price for them. But I think having flexibility in, in that roadmap is, is really key. Uh, and we could talk about uh, even, uh, you know, if, you're, if North Korea were to do certain things, how would you verify it, for instance? That, that is a, a thing that relates to the roadmap, um, but could be done outside of it. Again, just to sort of make a driving analogy, every afternoon when I am about to drive home and I know the traffic is going to be terrible, I open the, the, a the Waze app on my phone and I put in my address and it tells me different ways to get home, right? So there are different ways to make progress uh, on denuclearization. Second breakthrough specifically about the US, and I'll, I'll be very brief here. I've heard a lot about uh, sort of the conditions for sanctions relief and, and so forth, um, but really there is not a robust conversation in Washington about what the US is prepared to give. It's unfashionable, but it's also unrealistic. And, and frankly, it kind of breaks the fundamental laws of economics. It's been a long time since I took economics courses in college, but I clearly remember that there is no free lunch, right? We cannot have a free lunch or expect to have a free lunch here. Uh, and so the breakthrough that really needs to happen is the US, in the US mindset towards these talks. What is it that we are seeking to accomplish? What can we live with in the near term as distinct from our longer term objectives? Uh, and so that, I think, is the biggest breakthrough that we need to uh, achieve. It's more realism in, in U.S. objectives and ambitions. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Dalton. And uh, now I have a vision of a patient in intensive care trying to drive a car uh, home based on all these different analogies. I mean, it strikes me that, that the four uh, really excellent set of remarks re really all revolve around the question of how of using hard tools and coercive tools and sanctions versus establishing trust. And I, what I'm hearing from uh, many of the panelists is, and maybe even this is a consensus, that uh, the time when hard tools were going to be the core path to get to even interim progress is, is long past, and, that, and, that, and the maximum pressure approach is not going to work. And so th I think that's a framing set of questions for the rest of this discussion. I did want to go back and ask a couple more questions, but then uh, please uh, you know, start thinking of your questions um, in the audience. I wanted to come back to Ms. Lee and ask her about the question of time, because you said time is not on the side of the international community. And I do see some elements of that, but I also think time is not on North Korea's side either. They're facing an, a looming famine. Uh, for a number of reasons, at least that's my understanding. It's more significant than it's been in many, many years. Um, sanctions are still biting. Uh, pr uh, Chairman Kim has promised the people he will make life better. Uh, and while that's been the case for some people, uh, it really hasn't trickled down to the entire population. So he's under some you know, pretty significant pressure. And at the same time, he has not been um, improving his capabilities. There's been no tests of missiles, and I am, my personal opinion is there is no way he can have confidence that he has a workable ICBM. It was uh, 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 not nearly um, proven to the extent that it would be need to be proven for a confident, uh, confidence in that capability. His nuclear uh, warheads haven't been tested, and I think these things, you know, at a certain point, they're going to deteriorate. At the same time, though, we have you know, the, the U.S. And, and South Korea haven't been exercising either. And so that readiness factor, I think, is not on the time of, of the United States and, 
and South Korea. So I just wanted to hear more about your thoughts on, time, on how time plays, plays into this, not to mention the, the ticking clock towards the end of this year where Chairman Kim said, that's my deadline, and as well as President Trump beginning his reelection campaign, <coughs> which kicked off last night. But certainly, I would expect him to want to see some progress by the end of the year, too. So sorry for that long question, but it was all about time. Yes, I told you that time was not on the side of the international community. When I said that, I think uh, that was from our perspective, that we cannot really wait uh, forever. And I think it will be the same for North Korea. I probably would have told the same story to North Korea, that uh, time is not on their side either. Regarding the deadline of the end of December, maybe there could be many different dif uh, interpretations. But from my perspective, the reason that North Korea specified the deadline uh, I don't think they were sending out an ultimatum. I believe that it was more about creating space for negotiations. I believe that that was a goodwill message that they delivered to us. Then why December? As was mentioned, there is this U.S. re-election factor that would uh, come into play. And you've already mentioned that the re-election campaign started last night. But I believe that the uh, campaigning will start in full swing, um, probably from the end of this year. So uh, given that aspect, uh, December, if that was suggested as a deadline, probably was something that Kim Jong-un carefully crafted. And at the same time, towards the end of the year in December, uh, that's normally seen as a time for us to reflect upon the entire year. Uh, and we try to um, look back on the entire and probably he needs to send out a message to his people by that time. And if we go past December and if the circumstances, circumstances are still not satisfactory to North Korea, then would North Korea uh, go ahead and shoot a missile and conduct a test? I don't believe so. Maybe they will start to rethink about this process once again. Um, the change in the foreign policy of North Korea was uh, officially decided by the Workers' Party meeting. And I believe that given the current North Korean structure, it would not be the sole decision of one leader. And the reason that North Korea suggested December as the deadline was because of their willingness uh, to reconvene negotiations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Lee, and then I wanted to come back to Mr. Kim and his discussion of this cancer patient. And uh, my, my question is, with, you know, you're suggesting a lot of healing and a lot of care, but how do we keep this patient interested in, 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 this, in this doctor, Dr. Trump and Dr. Moon? How, how do we keep him interested if we, let, if, if we let him off the hook? If we get him a little better, he could run out of the hospital even though he's not fully healthy yet. So how do we keep him in the hospital until he's fully better? First of all, North Korea is not really a, a very bad case of cancer. Because to heal cancer and to denuclearize the North have one commonality, that there is constant uncertainty it is uncertain, and it still remains in the realm of imagination, and we try to turn it into reality, and it takes a lot of gumption and courage to make it into reality. In my view, the relationship between the doctor and the patient uh, got to understand and tackle the common challenge, whether it's President Trump or President Moon, they are great doctors, awesome doctors. They cannot really think of any alternative that can offer them any better hope. So I think that's really important. But inside the United States, there are certain people who really uh, get in the way of offering this option. According to their view, North Korea is a human rights violator. Even without a uh, nuclear issue, we should not really ease in the grip on uh, uh, sanctions. They uh, emphasize our morality, but it's very pharisaic, which is negative uh, dimension of uh, moralism, as mentioned in the Bible. You know, there was a woman who was caught in adultery, and the Pharisees demanded stoning her to death. 
Now, these people are demanding just sanction and sanction and more pressure. However, God said otherwise. This woman was under certain social situation that she was compelled to do something immoral, understanding her and where she comes from, and at the same time, respecting the person, then we don't really have to stone the person to death. That's the teaching of the Bible, in my understanding. We don't really have to punish and condemn the North, though some people say that I think the best definition of human rights is this, to give water to the thirsty and to give food to those who are hungry. And you don't give water, you don't give food, and you just continue to give only sanctions, and you say that it is a moralistic and human rights-based approach. I have certain reservation. When we really think about therapies or healing, instead of thinking about too much dose or too little dose, our focus rather should be on making it productive and making it bold and respecting the other party, making sure that we help them survive. And if that is our genuine purpose, our action should be bold and productive. And I think that's the uh, morality that is required of the doctor, if you will. So in that regard, I think the nose uh, presents itself as a case that can be truly completely healed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kim. And then my, my last question before turning to the audience. I, I wanted to get Ambassador Yoon and Dr. Dalton talking together about, uh, about what a deal might look like. Uh, I heard Dr. Dalton say, don't focus too much on Young Beyond. We've been there before. We don't want to buy it a third time. This thing's on layaway. Uh, and I heard uh, Ambassador Yoon really give the outlines of an interesting package which included Young Beyond, a definition of denuclearization, uh, a roadmap in exchange for some sanctions relief. But my own initial reaction to that, but maybe I'm an uh, old thinker, is the U.S. has kind of given a lot away for not a lot mm -hmm. from the North Korean side, so maybe you're considering this sort of a trust step. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get you two talking about, uh, about the Yoon package, as we'll call it, or <laughs> Yoon Alpha. Uh, <laughs> And also, yeah. in particular, yeah. talk about Young yeah. Beyond and anything yeah. else that, that you wanted yeah. to address. Are you sure it doesn't have to be plus beta? I mean, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I v I'm very much agreed with Toby. I think his layout is, 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 you know, is fine. Uh, it's a is, is very nice layout. And I would note that you know, my roadmap would include all the items that Toby mentioned. Uh, you know, at, are we giving in too much? Obviously, Barry, you are not listening to Representative Kim. You know, uh, you know, you need to give more. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it's a. Uh, we have to enter this negotiation with the idea that we have to address some of their concerns. If you're not prepared to address that, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, and, and if you look at the rationale of the five sanctions, and by the way, you know, initially you don't have to give all five, as I said, you know, but the rationale was it was almost always in response to nuclear tests yeah. or ICBM tests. These were the sanctions, five, san five UN Security Council uh, resolutions that went into effect in 2016 and 2017. So there is an argument that with the cessation of nuclear test and ICBM test, that it has come time to review them. So there is a mirror image on those yeah. two. And, and, and so I, I think it is something that the US side should consider, as I said, in return for something bigger than Yongbyon, you know? Yeah, yeah and I, I think just to extend that, that principle, um, if North Korea continues to not test nuclear weapons, not test missiles, I think that it, there's a, a production of also not making more, right? And so I think for me, that is the core around which a deal could be built because then it opens channels for, okay, which, which facility, which activity, how are we going to monitor it? Much more flexible than, okay, it has to be this place, right? And so then from that, it's easier also to tie it, I think, to certain kinds of sanctions relief or other measures. But I think it's worth remembering here that North Korean leaders and officials have been remarkably consistent over time 
in saying that they are intending essentially to compel the U.S. to change its hostile policy. We have to show them that we are also willing to change our hostile policy and when maximum pressure continues to be our policy, where's the change, right? They wanna see that something is going to be giving in the U.S. approach so that they know that they have that bright future that, that uh, representatives uh, uh, Lee and Vegan talked about this morning, that that actually is attainable, right? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much. Now I want to go to um, the audience's questions. I still have another 12 or so, but why don't we start with the lady in the back row with her hand up. And please identify yourself uh, when you ask your question. Please make sure they're questions and not statements. Cute. <laughs> uh, Siyang, reporter from Voice America. Uh, I'm sorry if there, I, I came a little bit late, if their topic has been, is for the, if the question has been touched on. Um, I, I, I apologize for that. So I'd like to take the uh, question topic a little bit away from North Korea to North Korea and China. We know Chinese President Xi Jinping is going to North Korea tomorrow. So I'm just wondering uh, how uh, the panelists think about it. Are China and North Korea teaming against, the, against Washington? Thank you. And if so, what the United States should do? Thanks very much. And this is an open question, but it, you took my question, my first question, right out of my mouth. Uh, but the way I would also package it is, you know, this isn't the first meeting between Xi and Kim. Uh, I haven't seen too many detailed public communiques out of those meetings. Uh, wish there were some. And uh, would really love to get the panelists' views on, you know, what, what are they, what, what kinds of things do you think they're going to come to conclusion about? Um, Really, does China share uh, our interests? And when I say our, I'm talking about the United States and, and South Korea. Or is there a divergence in the way Xi Jinping perceives the ultimate uh, path to progress in, in, these, in these discussions in this, pro in, the, in this overall process? And that's for all of our panelists, because it's a big question. Uh, Yes, there is a stalemate between Washington and Seoul, so intervention by China has a lot of significance. In the first session, a special representative Pigan mentioned that U.S. and China completely share one goal, common goal, to denuclearize the North. And his uh, assessment was very positive, and I couldn't agree with him more. However, that said, when it comes to how to denuclearize Pyongyang, it is something that has to be tackled fundamentally between so Pyongyang and Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, China's uh, intervention is positive only because the stalemate is going on. But if China's intervention goes on, it will make the calculus only more complicated. And if different uh, countries start to intervene in their own ways, and I think it will make the situation even worse and translate or transform into a uh, competition between Beijing and Washington, which is least desirable for Korea and Seoul in particular. It's not really, uh, it's actually due to certain degree incompetence of Washington. That Xi Jinping is visiting Pyongyang is an attrib is attributable to uh, lack of success by Washington government. And um, they can help to a certain degree, but this needs to be resolved by the U.S ultimately. And if the Korean Peninsula uh, conundrum is issued by major power politics, I think it will be only uh, hurting to the national interest of Seoul government. If all goes well between Beijing and Washington, it, we don't have to raise concerns, but it is not the situation because it is really in a very uh, dead-end competition between uh, uh, Beijing and Washington, and things will get even worse if other major powers involved. So we really got to approach this with this mindset. Great. And we're, we're going to hear more about uh, the broader question of the Indo-Pacific this afternoon. So, so really interested in, in that thought being yeah. picked up in a later panel. Yeah. Ambassador Yoon. Uh, uh, for China, denuclearization of North Korea is not, is important, but not highest priority. The highest priority is to have a friendly state, to have an ally, 
their high, uh, second highest pr priority is to make sure U.S. does not have a dominant position on North Korea. <coughs> and so, so it is true, they don't want North Korean nuclear weapons, but that's not their highest priority. I would say, as we go into this uh, big meeting, I think m some of you might have seen Xi Jinping's uh, article in Nodong Shinmun uh, today, early today. Uh, it, it, it showed that he's going in there with the idea that to show Trump that he has what I call his flank covered, you know, that he, his allies in the region are strong, and so he wants to use this card to, in, in this trade war with the uh, United States. So my expectation is that trade issues between U.S. and China have to be resolved, and in that wake, we can make progress on North Korea issues. But, but are you suggesting that unless the trade issues are resolved, there won't be progress on? I, I, I believe uh, there, there has to be uh, some resolution on the immediate trade issues. Mm -hmm. The long-term trade issues will never be resolved, but short-term trade issues can be resolved, and when that is done, then we can, we can expect progress. Ms. Lee, did you have any thoughts on the question? 그 우리 기자님께서 질문하실 때 어, What's the question? In, in response to the U.S., you asked whether China and North Korea are trying to form a team against the U.S., and I do not believe that that is the case. In the course of the last U.S. North Korea summit meeting. Actually, uh, if you think of the China North Korea summit meeting, as a matter of fact, everybody tried hard to make sure that China doesn't feel left out in the process of pursuing these talks on the Korean Peninsula. And whether China will try to take the initiative is uh, something that is being discussed these days. In other words, uh, the U.S.-North Korea uh, summit meeting uh, regarding that summit meeting, I believe that everybody is on the same page as to the direction of the negotiations, that we are trying to, we are going to try to resolve this issue through dialogue, and we're going to make sure uh, that China doesn't feel left out and probably pr try to provide the minimum level of happiness to China. For China, uh, maybe in order to take the strong initiative uh, by gaining certain uh, deliverables from North Korea, maybe uh, China will, might try to utilize uh, that gains from North Korea in order to resolve their disputes with the U.S. Uh, but I'm not sure whether China will actually be able to gain so much out of the uh, China-North Korea summit meeting to use it for its relations with the U.S. Uh, but at the same time, once again, I believe that China doesn't want to be, doesn't want to feel left out in the whole process. I, I associate myself firmly with that uh, assessment. Um, it's interesting that the Chinese have not put forward uh, any kind of affirmative agenda after the freeze for freeze proposal, uh, and it seems like their engagement has been much more tactical. Uh, they don't want to be blamed if it all blows up and the diplomacy goes bad. But if there is going to be a negotiation, they want to make sure that their interests are in play here. And so it's, it seems a little bit more of a Goldilocks uh, kind of, uh, you know, not too big, not too small, sort of just right strategy. Uh, and if North Korea is about to embark on a new round of diplomacy uh, through the summer and fall, the Chinese, I assume, want to be part of that diplomacy, even if they don't have specific objectives uh, in mind at this point. Is it possible uh, that, uh and, and this is, you know, really a President Trump question. Is it possible that a Chinese strategy could be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really push North Korea to make progress and come to the table, and then I'm going to call President Trump and say, I just helped you out a lot. Can you help me out on trade? It's kind of a different angle on this question that uh, certainly in the Trump era, you know, might have some traction. 
I think so, Barry. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, we were close to a deal, trade deal with China only a month ago. Yeah. Everyone thought there was a deal. I mean, you know, such a deal would not resolve trade, complete trade issues, but at least it's, an, it's, it's a deal that both could live by, or live with. Something similar like that, I think, could pave the way. I, I have a, a basic problem with the premise, though, which is that China could deliver sufficient pressure to give, get North Korea to do what we want, and I, I'm not sure that that is actually the case. I think. To, to go back to the analogy that was made this morning, sanctions and pressure can get you to a certain point, but ultimately there has to be bargaining, and we're at that point now. And a lot of that is USDPRK bargaining. China is ancillary to it. Very good point. Question from the audience? Yes, sir, over there. Hey, I'm a political historian. I take the long view here. Um, Mr. Beglin suggested this morning that um, denuclearization and other aspects of the Singapore Declaration could be uh, taken in parallel. So my question is, is it, uh, to Ambassador Yun, do you take the position there's a linkage between the uh, really three critical elements, the denuclearization, the uh, stable and lasting peace regime, which would eventuate into a new relationship between North Korea and the U.S. And uh, in terms of the peace regime, it's never been defined. We're struggling to define denuclearization. Has there been active uh, examination in the State Department as to what a peace regime would actually look like and how it could be implemented and whether it could be done in stages? And also, is there a linkage between the demilitarization of the peninsula, which is basically an armed camp, and denuclearization as a spur to denuclearization, creating a new atmosphere? So thank you. You're free to choose any of those eight questions to answer. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think always the US side, the State Department, has considered sequencing to be denuclearization then normalization, then peace regime, something like that. Always denuclearization comes first. So really, the Singapore agreement is the first time that they reverse that and put the idea of normalization, which is improvement in relationship, then peace regime, then followed by denuclearization. Uh, this was very much a reversal of traditional uh, State Department position and it's introduced a new element that these can be done uh, simultaneously and together at the same time, maybe in different tracks. So I, I think the Singapore Declaration in that sense has to be seen as the most, I would say, authoritative uh, position of uh, North Korea that has been somewhat accepted by Washington. So it's, it's a very important move. Thank you. Any other uh, questions for this panel? Yes, in the back. <laughs> uh, Henry Hecker, retired government. Uh, the current state of affairs, we've seized a North Korean coal delivery vessel, uh, which was violation of sanctions. And uh, I wondered, uh, this being the case, uh, should there be any change in the way forward? Uh, we've tried to do something at the United Nations on uh, this, you know, the cheating on sanctions by various nations, namely, I guess, China and Russia. Th that being the case, uh, what are we to do at this point uh, to avoid a conflict? So the question was, North, North Korea is cheating, China and Russia are complicit, H how should we factor that into our thoughts on the way ahead? Perhaps I, Mr. I, I think uh, uh, Moon Jung-in answered that the other day by saying they should send the ship back, right? <laughs> you know, which didn't go down real well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 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 I do believe that there is uh, a lot of cheating going on but sanctions by their nature more you stay longer it lasts more erosion there will be that's why they have to be continually renewed 
with additional sanctions and that's what's happening that's the reality of sanctions you're going to develop holes and which is why you have to strengthen sanctions and I, I mean I'm completely agreement with Toby in the sense that you know uh, maximum pressure is still on and we need to change that attitude if we are to move to serious negotiations okay I'm going to take uh as we're getting closer to the end, I'm going to take a few questions at once. First, um, Ambassador Birschbau from the Atlantic Council, and then uh, I have a couple other hands. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for a very interesting panel. Uh, I'm Sandy Birschbau here, former ambassador in, in Seoul. Uh, I fully agree with all the panelists that uh, we need to get to a step-by-step -step approach with limited uh, st steps on denuclearization as part of the mix, but, but limited sanctions relief some step toward a peace treaty, which could be the end of war declaration, uh, and uh, opening of liaison offices, a step towards normalization. There's, there's a lot of ways to sequence these things, but clearly the administration is uh, overly rigid on the sanctions release pe relief piece. They want to go step by step on everything but the one thing that the North Koreans are, are desperate for, and which would demonstrate a readiness to move away from the so-called hostile policy. But it seems to me that you still need some kind of commitment as part of the package to the, to the end state. And you can't kick the, the end state down the road in an interim deal or else you're, you're de facto codifying North Korea as a nuclear power. Uh, but my question is, do we have any uh, sense of how the North Koreans define denuclearization? And remembering that the Singapore statement refers to denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, not just of North Korea. I mean, do we have a sense of how extreme their demands are likely to be, uh, you know, up to and including the total dismantlement of the ROK-US alliance, or are they prepared to accept something more modest, such as in the six-party talks of just sort of a commitment not to reintroduce nuclear weapons in the South, which would be, I think, doable? Uh, is there any sign that, uh, that the North Koreans uh, have, a, have a reasonable position on what reciprocal dimension denuclearization would have. Thank you, Sandy. And then we had a question in the back. Yes. Uh, 안녕하세요. Michelle Misuguan입니다. Uh, 제가 좀 여쭤보고 싶은 게 우리 혹시 패널들 중에 어 uh, 북한에서 오신 분들이 계십니까? I wonder whether any of the panelists have come from North Korea. I guess not. According to what I hear, I thought that maybe uh, some of you uh, talked uh, like somebody who came from North Korea. Uh, your comments were all very interesting. I believe that we need to approach this issue uh, from the very fundamental aspect first. Between the U.S. and South Korea, there is this alliance that's in place. and. I believe that the Rock US alliance is going through the most difficult and challenging uh, period uh, compared to any other point in time in the history of Korea. And from our perspective, this is what we think. The current government is uh, being really close to North Korea, that they are maintaining really close relations with North Korea. And uh, the majority of people seem to believe that, uh, I don't know how to put this, uh, that maybe there was some stealing involved. But on the other hand, uh, there are people who believe that the opposite is the case. Um, uh, attending this seminar today, uh, I get to have some concerns. Uh, these voices do not represent the whole voice of the entire Korean people. So I do not want to see the Atlantic Council to completely rely on the comments made by the panelists who are represented here. You need to hear the other voices as well. Uh, over the years, uh, there have been many tricks that have been employed by the North Koreans, and there have been many cheatings. Uh, you know the story of the uh, uh, ship shepherd, right? Uh, OK. Uh, we'll go to the next question. I think I understand your question very well. And then the last one is here in the front. 
Thank you for thank you for coming. Uh, nobody talks about uh, the ultimate goal of North Korea, uh, which which I don't know that for sure. My speculation is that uh, unification of the uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, by the way, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, the Reagan Foundation. Um, because if that's the ultimate goal, then they will never, ever give up the nuclear weapons they have. So can uh, Mr. Kim or uh, Ms. Lee can talk about that or even anybody? Thank you. So the three questions we have, and not a lot of time, so let's uh, also uh, include those as con concluding comments from Ambassador Vershbow. You know, h how expansively will, do we think North Korea will define denuclearization of the peninsula? Will it be expansive or, or more modest? From the back, uh, I got the sense that uh, concern, we were only hearing sort of one side from the South Korean side and the alliance is in a bit of crisis and shouldn't we have more conservative, I think, <laughs> views is what I kind of heard. Um, but let me know what you think. And then lastly, uh, a very good question, really. You know, wh wh what does North Korea want out of this and what should we want out of this as a result? And we'd love to hear from each panelist and then we'll, we'll wrap it all up for now. Mr. Kim, perhaps you first. Yeah, good. Our rock us alliance is going through the toughest time, and the current government is subservient to the Pyongyang regime, which I completely disagree. I understand where the question comes from, but the conclusion that you made, I cannot agree with you. And regarding North Korea's denuclearization, how we can define that, I think the process to define it captures the entire ways that are required to uh, go ahead. Uh, Bush Bao uh, mentioned, uh, Ambassador mentioned, denuclearization. What is the end state? Well, it may be relevant only as so far as well, how we can define that, but this should not result in and cannot result in uh, collapsing the alliance as it was discussed. Uh, uh, between Chairman Kim and President Moon. And Chairman Kim mentioned that he can tolerate the presence of the U.S. Uh, forces in Korea. And the same message was communicated to Secretary Pompeo, tolerating uh, the U.S. presence, uh, U.S. arms presence, uh, means that the presence of U.S. Uh, military is not going to be the, the topic that will be negotiated. I don't want to be too conceptual. The U.S., uh, rather, the North views the nuclear as a very indispensable tool for their survival. It will be very hard to give it up on them, give up on them. But diplomacy is needed for that very purpose, to making it happen. And there are many cases where humanity made it come true. And I think it is a, a matter of having faith and continuing to work th toward that. reason why they have nuclear weapons is not because of national security, is not because of you know some kind of they want economic bargain. I think they have nuclear weapons for regime survival. Uh, they want regime survival. They want Kim Dynasty survival and those associated with it. So as long as they see external threat, they will have nuclear weapons. I also believe if they see internal threat, remember nuclear weapons is also deterrence from outside interference into domestic issues. So I do believe nuclear weapons are there to stop whether it's South Korea or United States intervening in, in domestic issues. I think that's why it is there. Uh, I have no doubt. I agree completely. There is a fundamental strength in ROK-US alliance. Uh, you know, this is true in public opinion in South Korea, as well as true in public opinion in the United States. So I mean, all this talk about uh, alliance being in danger, I think is grossly exaggerated. Mostly exaggerated, unfortunately, by because it's become a domestic political issue in South Korea. 
you know, you, you know, where you are on alliance somehow defines whether you're conservative or whether you're progressive. And so I, I, so I, think, I think it's a badly confused definition. And, and, and if that stops, I think all the, you know, about alliance being in danger will stop too, you know? Thank you. Uh, my comment, just a few points, more than any other time in history, the strong strength between the alliance can be vividly felt. Each nation's positions try to be understood from each other's point, trying to be in others' head. I think we are at the optimum point. I think the alliance is very strong. The U.S. carries different domestic opinions. Likewise, the, uh, Korea has different opinions inside the nation. Nevertheless, regarding President Moon's performance regarding different areas, diplomacy and security, particularly inter-Korean relationship, positive feedback goes as high as 80 percent. That gives uh, President Moon a unique advantage over continuing with uh, uh, the government administration makes it stronger than any other previous government, despite many challenges in economy and what have you. There is an advisory council that helps President Moon regarding reunification matter. There was a survey in the first quarter about uh, North Korea, Kumgangsan project and the Kaesan industrial project. How will they help or not help? Uh, unification, there was a, a feedback that more than half believed that it will be in favor of helping the process move forward. Whether we talk about whether we trust North Korea, but before we talk about that, we should try to incorporate North Korea into the international community. We really got to do our best to make it happen so that our goal can be achieved. Whether we are talking about Kumgang Mountain in, uh, tourist project or Kaesong industrial project, we should not really view them as rewards given to the North. But actually, we should really see it as a tool that helps to achieve our goal by bringing and incorporating North Korea closer into the international community. Thank you. Uh, I, I've never, I don't believe I've ever been accused of being a, uh, a North Korea sympathizer before. So it's um, <laughs> very thank you for giving me a new experience for the day. I, I appreciate it. I do. Um, so on the, on the question of what North Korea wants, there, there's an interesting uh, piece that was in Voice of America yesterday that was a, a, a apparently a leaked North Korea document. I don't know anything about the veracity of this document, but it, it purported to be an internal communication that said that North Korea's objective after the Hanoi summit was to be recognized as, I think, a strategic nuclear state or something like that, which suggests to me that not only do they have nuclear weapons, but they're intent on keeping nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future. I think our policy has to recognize that reality uh, and, and, and identify steps short of denuclearization that are better than where we're at today and more durable than where we're at today um, uh, with the aspiration that sometime down the road we might get to that, that desired end state. Maybe that's like Obama's statement of, I support disarmament, just not in my lifetime. Um, you know, maybe it's like that. M maybe we can be more aspirational than that and, and work on a faster timeline. I don't know. But until we actually get into negotiation and test that proposition, we just can't tell. Great. Thank you. Um, before we thank our panelists, just wanted to uh, say what's next. Uh, we now have a lunch break uh, where there's uh, box lunches out there. If you could be back here by one oh five. So a relatively brisk American-style uh, lunch. And we have a fantastic uh, conversation at 105 with um, Professor Chung In Moon and Ambassador Paula Dobriansky. And um, uh, for now, please, if you could join me in thanking our uh, fantastic panelists.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paula Durbriansky. I'm uh, on the board uh, of the Atlantic Council. And I understand we had a vibrant, vibrant uh, morning, uh, a good discussion, a uh, good debate, uh, and that we're going to be continuing that mm -hmm. uh, over this luncheon session. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Chung Eun Moon, mm -hmm. who is the senior ad uh, special advisor uh, to President Moon Jae-in for unification, foreign and national security affairs. And you're also a distinguished professor at Yonsei University. And uh, Dr. Moon is going to very specifically give opening comments. And in his opening comments, I know one of the areas that you want to address is the US uh, ROK alliance. But you also have some other points you want to, to make. So we'll begin with your opening comments without further ado. And uh, then I'll have some questions. And we'll see how we go. We may have some time at the end, as long as no one gives speeches, that uh, at the end, we will have a few questions from our audience. Dr. Moon, welcome to you. I'm Please Mr. join Dobransky. me in welcoming Dr. Moon. Ambassador Dobransky, thank you very much for your kind introduction. You know, I, I don't have any prepared text, and therefore I'll be speaking for myself, not for the government, okay? Okay, and all right. There are three major issues. One is alliances. Uh, one lady raised the issue of erosion of ROK US in the alliance. Therefore, I'll make a few remarks on the alliance. And second, I will talk about the Hanoi summit. You know, and what was the you know, causes of the statement in Hanoi? What is the South Korean alternative? And third, I'll be briefly talking about you know, how to get away from current statement and to make a new breakthrough. Okay. An alliance, a lot of people talk about the uh, erosion of alliance, and a lot of people argue that the uh, Moon Jae-in government is a pro-North Korean government, and uh, Moon Jae-in wanted to have, wanted to improve inter-Korean relation at the expense of alliance, uh, but I think that is not true. When you talk about cohesiveness alliance, uh, you should look at the several indicators. The most important indicator a is, where there is any alteration in mutual defense treaty between ROK and US. There's no change at all. ROK US mutual defense treaty remains okay, intact and well you know, enforced. Second important indicator is whether there is any change in status of you know, foreign troops in that country, host country. And we have American forces in South Korea. We have about 26,000 American forces in Korea. There is no signs of changes of American forces status in South Korea, despite widespread speculation that the North Korean leader asked the, you know, the withdrawal of American forces in South Korea. President Moon has been very clear on that position. And third, whole issue of a combined forces command. You know, our local US combined forces command remains intact. There might be change when there is completion of transfer of wartime operational control. But still, ROK US will be, will be maintaining Combined Forces Command. In the case, ROK First Star may become commander. American Three Star General may serve as a you know, deputy commander. But the, the structure of Combined Forces Command will remain intact. And fourth, there has been a whole debate on the defense cost sharing and defense burden sharing. Uh, we spend about 2.7% of our GDP for defense sector. Our defense burden is much higher than any allies of NATO. Okay? And also, as to defense cost sharing, President Trump has been urging us to pay more defense cost. Uh, we in increased almost you know, 50%. We used to pay about uh, 940 billion won uh, up until last year, and then we'll be uh, paying more than one no, trillion won uh, starting from this year. Therefore, there, there has been a huge increase in defense you know, cost sharing. And also another important indicator is whether there is a strong public support of the alliance or not. I would say that there is very strong support of you know, 
allocated alliance in South Korea. Given all these indicators, I don't see any major you know, problems. But uh, you know, the, for example, you know, in the afternoon, we'll be talking about Indo-Pacific strategy. You know, and there will be the question raised whether South Korea will be participating in Indo-Pacific strategy or not. But apart from that, then I don't see any major changes. And also, you have to remember, you know, South Korea has created the largest overseas U.S. military base in South Korea, in the world, okay? Uh, it's huge, okay? It's almost uh, uh, 9 million in square meters, okay? The, the, the largest overseas American base Okay, is now you know, constructed in South Korea. And given all these things, I don't see any major you know, sources of erosion of allocated U.S. In alliance tie. But the second issue, what happened to Hanoi? We have all kinds of gossips on, on the causes of uh, failure to reach agreement in Hanoi. But uh, the bottom line is very simple and straightforward. The U.S. come up with the so-called big deal. It depicted means what? All for all. North Korea got to dismantle nuclear, biochemical, and missiles. All then we'll promise bright future of North Korean economy. That was kind of American deal. Therefore, all for all, all or nothing. Okay? And North Korea, you dismantle first, then we'll come up with a reward. That is the basic in the nature of American big deal. But the North Korean proposal was what Western media called a small deal. North Korean proposal was that, uh, okay, we'll make a complete dismantling of all the nuclear facilities in Yongbyon. The U.S. got uh, lift sanctions, particularly U.N. Security Council sanction resolutions since 2006, five sanction resolutions, as they are related to civilian economy and the people's livelihood. Of course, the U.S. turned it down. For example, Toby Dalton raised the issue of the magnitude of you know, young nuclear facilities. Okay. For example, you all know David Albright. He argues that the young men would account for 50% of North Korean total nuclear weapons capability. But the Siegfried Heck at Stanford University argues that young men would account to 60 to 70 percent of all nuclear weapons capability in North Korea. And also, you may recall that uh, North Korean Foreign Minister Lee Yong ho gave a press conference at midnight on February 28th, and Lee Yong ho made it very clear. Okay, dismantling of nuclear facility young men will be starting point. And when there is a success deal, and afterwards, if there is trust built between U.S. and North Korea, uh, you, North Korea can take uh, additional measures. Okay, but that's uh, in a big difference. Uh, then South Korean proposal is so-called a good enough deal. Okay, let us make a comprehensive agreement on all for all. Okay, however, its implementation needs to be incremental, the step by step implementation. But as uh, Ambassador Steve Vegan pointed out, but we need a very clearly defined roadmap with timetable. And also our government position is this. <coughs> After the Hanoi stalemate, uh, there is a you know, huge trust gap you know, between Washington and Pyongyang. In order to break that the trust, trust gap, North Korea should take uh, some proactive actions. Chairman Kim Jong-un uh, declared that he demolished two-thirds of uh, underground nuclear facilities in Punggye-ri. If that is the case, why can North Korea invite inspectors from International Atomic en Energy Agency, even from the United States? So let, the, let them do some soil sampling, gamma test, and etc. And another important action which North Korea can take is the whole issue of uh, nuclear uh, missile facilities in Dongchang-ri. If you look at the uh, Article 5 of Pyongyang Declaration, North Korean leader committed that uh, he will dismantle missile engine test site and launching pad in Dongchang-ri without any preconditions. Therefore, our government position is, uh, why don't you do, do that? 
then we can persuade the United States to come up with some kinds of sanction relief. But North Korea has not done that. Therefore, our government position is that North Korean leader has been talking about actions and committed himself, but we, don't, we haven't seen any concrete actions. Okay. That is our government position. That is what he called the good enough deal. And finally, how to make a breakthrough to the current stalemate. Up to now, each has been between denuclearization on the one hand and sanction relief on the other hand. But we all discovered that in Washington, there is a theology of sanction, cult of sanction proponents. And it is extremely difficult to overcome that one. Uh, therefore, instead of really asking for sanction relief, if North Korea makes a concrete you know, progress in denuclearization, then there will be uh, automatic resolution of sanction issues. Then how can we make North Korea uh, uh, you know, really take uh, concrete measures uh, toward the denuclearization? Maybe then, as you know, Ambassador Vegan pointed out, uh, maybe US can put uh, all these security assurance issues up front. And security assurance is composed of political assurance and military assurance. Political assurance means diplomatic normalization. Military assurance, the most important aspect of military assurance is non-aggression treaty. You know, it doesn't cost any money. Okay? And if the US and North Korea can talk about it, then if there is a you know, uh, security assurance that can be accepted to North Korea, then North Korea should take uh, concrete measures towards denuclearization. Then there, there should be simultaneous reduction of sanctions against North Korea. Then they can create this kind of you know, virtuous cycle among three elements. Okay? That is what I've thought about most recently. I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, you were very clear in your, your remarks about uh, uh, the three areas, the three issues. So let me begin with this, uh, where we are today. How would you define where we are today? Uh, it was stalled, the discussions after uh, Hanoi. Um, and you've defined several elements that at least suggest have been obstacles to moving forward. But what do you think is, one, the biggest obstacle that has to be addressed in moving this process forward? No and are we running out of time? from your perspective? Yeah, time is on the nobody, nobody's side, you know, because if we fail to you know, deal with North Korea, then starting from 2020, 20, North Korea may be taking much worse actions than in 2017, okay? But here, one important factor is this. Now go back to 2017. North Korea test launched 15 ballistic missiles, undertook six nuclear testing. There was a hydrogen bomb. Yeah, we are on the verge of you know, major you know, mili military breakout, break out. but 2018 was a very, very peaceful you know, Korean, we had a very peaceful Korean peninsula. And 2019, we have a kind of transitional setback, okay? Therefore, I think it is, you know, we can overcome the kind of problem. But the whole point is this, um, as to North Korea, you know, as we have discussed, um, <coughs> whether North Korean leader has a real will and intention to give up its nuclear weapons. Would North Korea either make a strategic decision or not? But so far, North Korea has not taken any actions other than freezing its nuclear and missile activities. So, therefore, North Korean leader should show some concrete indicators of his strategic you know, decision. But on the, on the part of the United States, the United States has not been very clear on what he can give to North Korea in return for North Korea's strategic decision, okay? The United States has been talking about bright future, bright future of North Korean economy. That's not you know, concrete enough. Therefore, you know, the US got to be much more specific in what it can give to North Korea. And North Korean leaders should take a very firm strategic actions toward the denuclearization. By the way, what do you think is Kim Jong-un's ultimate intention here? Because you mentioned it in your response just now. What do you see as his <coughs> primary intention and goal? But, you know, given President Moon's interaction with uh, North Korean leader, 
for example, in April, Pan uh, Moon two leaders working under the bridge. Mm -hmm. And President Moon raised the issue of North Korean denuclearization very strongly. And Chairman Kim Jong un responded in this way. If we, have, if we talk more frequently with the United States, if we build a trust with the US, if we, if we have a non-aggression treaty with the United States, why should we suffer by having nuclear weapons? And denuclearization is the will of my grandfather and father. And President Moon took it very seriously. And then when we, go to, when we went to Pyongyang, September last year, and I was a special delegate, <laughs> and we could sense in North Korea really in a committee. As Congress, our National Assembly women, Lee Jae Jung pointed out, you know, th th there was you know, really a shift of North Korean emphasis from military first politics to economic first politics. Maybe you know, Chairman Kim Jong un will be in weighing which one is more beneficial to his regime security mm -hmm. by having nuclear weapons and suffering from sanction by giving up nuclear weapons and enjoying economic prosperity and longevity of his regime, he might be still you know, you know, deliberating on those two options. But if the United States can come up with more so-called uh, attractive incentive to North Korea, he may you know, uh, switch to okay, giving up nuclear weapons and enjoying peace and prosperity. Well, you, you've used the term in a number of your writings and lectures of constructive compromise. Uh, you've essentially have described that here, but you might want to say a bit more on that. But let me go to this second point. You just mentioned what incentive, that if he's incentivized, that there might be some further movement here. What do you think that Kim Jong-un would want the most? from the United States uh, in terms of on the uh, table? Is it the sanctions? Is it, is it something else? Well, he made a very interesting speech at the Supreme People's Congress in a meeting in April. He said, OK, we won't be talking about sanction relief. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is security assurance. Then what does it mean? I interpret it in such a way that first, diplomatic normalization with the United States. Second non-aggression non treaty with the United States. Because if the you know, US can come up with some kind of institutionalized guarantee, those two elements, then uh, there is a very, very good chance that Kim Jong-un give up its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Then sanction risk issue will be automatically resolved. What kind of role going forward do you think that South Korea should play? It already has played a very pivotal role in, uh, in, uh, in many ways. But what do you think are the most important elements that you would want to share and highlight uh, in this process? Right now, President Moon is very much interested in facilitating US DPRK in a, uh, the talks between the two leaders. Okay? That's the most important thing. But one thinks in the making progress, uh, we can play in a multiple role. We can be in a direct party to the the negotiation. Also, we can be facilitator, we can be mediator. Therefore, we can play multiple roles. But right now, President Moon is very much interested in revitalizing dialogue between President Trump and Chairman Kim Jong-un. But in your own personal view, what do you think is the best position and role for uh, South Korea to play? You mentioned there could be multiple roles. What do you think is the most important role that South Korea can play? It's a very difficult question. You know, President Moon has been arguing that he'll be taking leading role, key role. But President Moon is kind of sandwiched by the American emphasis on alliance interest, mm -hmm. North Korean emphasis uh, of interest of Korean nation. Okay? But being sandwiched to demand, he's trying to find out niches for promotion of national interest of South Korea. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he'll be going along that line. Okay. Therefore, you know, North Korean demand, American demands are very important, but he has a, his own mandate given by the South Korean people. She, he should promote the national interest. That means what? Nuclear weapons free, peaceful and prosperous Korean peninsula. Mm -hmm. Let's take a little bit more time on this concept of positive reinforcement uh, for the uh, DPRK. 
uh, because you've put that forth. And again, that's something that you yourself have also written about. How do you respond to those that do take the position that you have to have the denuclearization up front? And uh, you know, uh, where do you build the trust? How, how do you respond to that? How do you get from here to there? You've touched upon that in some of your opening remark, but I mean, what would be your core response and answer as to why you think it's important to take this kind of approach versus the other approach? Well, I think it, is, it seems to be very important to understand the North, North Korean way of thinking. For example, look at the case of sanction. North Korea sees sanction as a very important indicator of hostile intention and policy of the United States. Therefore, American sanctions a sign of enmity on the part of North Korea. Therefore, if you look at the Article 1 of Singapore Declaration, US and DPRK have a new relationship. North Korean understanding is that new relationships start with uh, relaxation of sanctions. But the American position is sanction comes last. Okay? If, if North Korea get rid of nuclear weapons, then we'll start you know, relax sanctions on North Korea. There's a huge difference. But Ambassador, you raised a very important point. In fact, uh, Kim Jong-de, you know, our National Assemblyman Kim Jong-de raised that issue. Uh, whenever I come to Washington, there seems to be two schools in Washington. One school is a crime and punishment school crime and punishment school. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, Mr. John Bolton seems to belong to that, you know, that school. Then Mr. North Korea committed crime. Therefore, North Korea got to be punished. But other school is what B.F. Skinner calls in a positive enforcement. That means what? If North Korea shows a small good behavior, then you praise North Korea, okay? And give us some incentive. And that is the you know, best way changing North Korean behavior. Okay? I would say that President Trump belongs to that category. Okay? Therefore, there seems to be very interesting bureaucratic you know, <laughs> in a infighting between you know, crime and punishment school and uh, positive reinforcement school. But let me also, I'm going to challenge you a little bit further because let's say you pursue the path of incentive base. What kind of signal would that send to other countries across the globe who are considered to be rogue nations and who also are in possession of nuclear weapons? Um, is that the same kind of approach then that is going to serve as a model for others? There always are ramifications for what you do in one area and what ramifications that may have for other areas and other challenges. How would you deal with that? You know, that is good in a point because whenever, you know, you advocate a positive enforcement and an incentive-based approach in North Korea, then people instantly recall salami tactics. You know, North Korea, okay, you know, hold this, you know, North Korea selling same host twice or three times, okay. And Toby, Tarleton, to Toby Dalton said it, you know, now North Korean uh, Youngden proposal is third time and whatever. But here, whole point is this. We give an incentive to North Korea if North Korea makes very concrete progress toward the denuclearization, okay? For example, I take North Korean proposal in Yongbyon nuclear facilities. You know, that's a really big deal, as I pointed out, you know. Mm -hmm. Siegfried the hacker is the person who had been to Yongbyon facilities four times. He's the first person who reported on the existence of highly in uranium facility in Yongbyon. But and also, he, was, he served as a director of Los Alamos Laboratory for 12 years. He knows about the nuclear you know, facilities, materials, and weapons. But he's saying that the young men account for 60 to 70 percent. Let us accept it. And let us give us some you know, uh, reward in return. You know? mm -hmm. Therefore, I would say that if really North, makes, North Korea makes concrete, not words and commitment, actions, toward the denuclearization, I think North Korea deserves some you know, uh, reward from our side. Let me address uh, a, a different point. Uh, one of the areas that I think the ROK has certainly emphasized is the importance of uh, incentives in inter-Korean economic projects. And there are quite a few that can in fact be cited, which 
President Moon and the government certainly has, uh, has supported the joint railroad project, the Quezon Industrial Complex, um, uh, uh, and it goes on. And also recently, I understand that the Moon administration wired eight million of humanitarian aid to the World Food Program and the UN Children's Fund. How beneficial have these projects been in your estimation? Uh, share with us what you think have been the benefits of these inter-Korean uh, economic projects. You know, inter-Korean economic relations can be very you know, useful tool for the controlled approach to North Korea. For example, if we you know, relax UN Security Council sanction, UN Security Council sanction resolutions on North Korea, then there could be you know, complete opening of border with China and border with Russia. But in the case of inter-Korean economic exchange and cooperation, and I think that will just you know, confine to the, you know, the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, but also, you know, when we argue that uh, you know, resumption of Gaseong Industrial Complex or resumption of Mount Gumgang Tourist Project, okay, and in, for example, you go back to November last year, President Moon Jae-in made a proposal to uh, European countries that uh, if North Korea takes irreversible stage you know, of denuclearization, or the beginning of irrevers irreversible stage of denuclearization, we can think about the uh, you know, resumption of Gaseong Industrial Complex and Mount Tourist, Mount Kumgang Tourist Project. Therefore, if North Korea takes very concrete moves toward the denuclearization, I think it is well worth to think about you know, resumption of gas and industrial complex and Mount Kumgang Choice project. But in the case of Mount Kumgang Choice project, if there is no transfer of bulk cash to North Korea, okay, there is no jurisdiction to ban that kind of you know, uh, choice to travel. Therefore, if South Korean individuals go to Mount Kumgang, that, is, that does not violate the UN Security Council you know, uh, you know, sanction resolutions, but the South Korean government has been doing that uh, because of its respect to the United States. The U.S. has shown the, some reservation on that one. Therefore, if the United States shows some kind of flexible approach to the issues, then they can foster the process of denuclearization of North Korea. It would also be very good to know and understand what is your vision or definition of Korean unification? Uh, because I think when that question gets asked, uh, there are different answers given. What, how would you, know, you define you know, Korean unification? You know, you know, to answer to your question, we need to really define what is meant by Korean unification. Mm -hmm. It can be one nation, one state, one system, and one government. There is one single unified nation state. It would be very difficult. It can be taken in the form of like a German type of unification by absorption, or you know, North Korean type. North Korea has been pursuing United Front strategy to communize South Korea. Under two, one of two conditions, there can be that kind of one single, you know, unified nation state. But the North Korean proposal is a federation and confederation approach. That means what? One people, one state, two systems, and two local governments. But South Korea cannot accept that proposal because we cannot accept you know, communism and capitalism, North Korean Suryongje, you know, supreme leader system, and South Korean democratic system on one you know, umbrella of one state. Therefore, it is totally inconceivable to South Korea. That is why since 1989, South Korean government has been proposing the model of so-called union of North South Korean state. That means what? One people, two state, two governments, and two systems. Yet, we can promote exchange and cooperation, reconciliation, and free flow of goods and people and services. We call it de facto unification, like a European Union. Okay? Then we hope that there can be increasing homogeneity between North and South Korea in terms of systems. Then as to the ultimate form of unification, then people who are coming after us can adopt you know, some kinds of constitution through the inter-Korean consultation and have a national referendum. Therefore, our government, Moon Jae-in government's approach is 
Union of North South Korean State. That means, again, one people, two states, two systems, and two governments. Dr. Moon, I have just a few questions, more questions about summitry. And then, as I suggested and uh, you graciously offered, we'll go to a few questions from the audience. But uh, we've heard that President Moon uh, would like to meet with Kim Jong-un uh, uh, before the upcoming uh, Trump-Moon uh, summit in Seoul. Uh, it, what would be on the agenda if, uh, if such a meeting took place? And how would you envision that meeting shaping the priorities um, uh, of the uh, subsequent Trump-Moon meeting in this it's case? It's very, very important because mm -hmm. immediate, immediately after the Hanoi summit, President Trump was on board the Air Force One and made a phone call to President Moon Jae-in and ask President Moon Jae-in Moon Jae to figure it out. Why North Korea turned down American offer? What President, the Chairman Kim Jong-un has in mind? And again, when President Moon met the President Trump on April 11th in Washington, D.C., again, President Trump asked President Moon to figure it out, what North Korean had, leader has in mind. Therefore, it is a, in a imperative for President Moon to have summit talk with North Korean leader. If you go back to May 26th last year, North Korea you know, gave a notice to South Korea that the Chairman Kim Jong-un wanted to have a you know, one point summit with President Moon Jae-in, just 20, 20 hours before the meeting. The deal went very well. That was before the so-called Singapore summit. Therefore, I'm hoping that the North Korea would you know, accommodate President Moon's proposal to have a one point summit, you know, most likely in Panmunjom, before President Trump's visit to you know, Seoul. So what would you see as the priority uh, uh, on the agenda of uh, a Trump Moon uh, uh, meeting. But again, you know, it's an American big deal, North Korean small deal, South Korean good enough deal. There must be some kind of coordination <laughs> among trees, okay? Then again, I think that whatever summit you know, to be held, you know, the issue will be the denuclearization, security assurance, and sanction relief. You know, how to juggle around with those three in elements. That I think that will be the most important you know, summit agenda. And then uh, let's just ask this. Uh, uh, what, in your view, would then be a successful third summit uh, in this case, post Hanoi? The more, in my personal opinion, the most important thing is North Korean action <laughs> to denuclearize, no matter how small it might be. Therefore. Dong Changli, Pungeri, let North Koreans take actions. Otherwise, nobody in Washington will believe that the North Korean leader has any intention and will to denuclearize. Therefore, Chairman Kim Jong Un has a mandate to get rid of that kinds of, you know, suspicions. You know, look, whenever I come to Washington, about thirty percent pessimist, thirty percent skeptic, thirty percent, you know. Uh, in a cynics, 10% optimist out of 10%, 9% cautious optimist, okay? <laughs> All you, Steve Began, when I, when I met him a month ago in Seoul, he told me, oh, I belong to 1% optimist. And he even added one more point, President Trump belongs to that 1% optimist <laughs> category. But why those 90% you know, pessimist, the skeptics, and you know, cynics? <laughs> North Korea has not taken any concrete actions. Therefore, Chairman Kim Jong-un should take a very concrete actions. All right. Uh, questions. We have time, as I indicated, uh, for a few questions from the audience. Yes, please. And if you don't mind, maybe you already introduced yourself, but please introduce yourself. And all I ask is pithy. <laughs> uh, David Maxwell, Foundation for Defense and Democracies. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the recent Voice of America report uh, about North Korea and Kim Jong-un. Uh, saying that he will not denuclearize. And of course, that confirms the US intelligence estimate uh, that says he has no intention of denuclearizing. Uh, you've talked about uh, uh, Kim needing to take uh, concrete steps. Uh, but what gives you hope that he will denuclearize in the face of such a report and estimates of the intelligence community? OK, thank you. And thank you for your directness of your question <coughs> and conciseness. <laughs> Colonel Maxwell, you raised a very important issue. but. The we need more in the time to make the analysis of the documents. Okay? There could be just the 
documents within the military, produced by the military, or that whether that document is produced by the Department of Propaganda and Agitation. Okay? Therefore, in other words, you know, military folks can come up with that kind of directives and study together. Okay? But uh, we should see whether it's really issued by the you know, Central Committee of Korea Workers' Party. Okay? Therefore, I really don't think that our intelligence community has reached the kind of you know, conclusion. And also, it was, again, obtained through Japanese sources, okay? And then tra transferred to the Voice of America. But there is some element of in intelligence uncertainty that we should go through. It. We need some time, okay? We should make a very detailed analysis of the documents. Okay. Yes, sir. Dan Bob with uh, SICE. Good to see you, Chung In, always. Um, thanks for your comments. Question about American. Uh, presidential election, which is in full swing already. I wonder if you could give your sense of how that might affect the thinking of the North Koreans. Um, for example, in 10, 12 months, we'll have a better sense of who the Democratic nominee is, and to the extent that Trump is uh, behind, say, and desperate for some sort of major accomplishment overseas, North Koreans might want to wait that out to see where things are. and how much more leverage they might have. But anyway, your, your sense of, of what it's the impact is. It's up to American voters, you know. Maybe, you know, if President Trump can resolve the North Korean issue substantively, substantially, then that will really help President Trump's campaign next year. Suppose North Korea doesn't do that, and there is a, in a, a recurring image of 19, uh, 2017, heightened tension, North Koreans undertake some missile testing, nuclear testing, and et cetera, then President Trump is most likely to take a hardline position on North Korea, even including deliberation on military options. I don't know whether that will help President Trump or not. But one thing is very clear, if President can resolve in a, in a major portions of North Korean nuclear problem, that would be a great asset to his presidential campaign. But even if there is a crisis, you know, well, American voters tend to support the incumbent president when there is a crisis abroad. They've been either, either way, you know, they can help President Trump. But I also interpreted his question to mean, how does it factor in the North Korean position and Kim Jong-un? The fact that we are having our, quest, uh, our elections. And also, I think that Kim Jong-un had set a deadline, I thought, at the end of this year there were some indications along those lines. So how did the elections affect their calculations? No, what, what I'm telling you is kind of my indirect answer to your question, okay? North Korea has been extremely attentive to American domestic politics, extremely attentive, okay? They will be calculating it. Therefore, whenever the last year of incumbent president, North Korea does not used to, not to cooperate with the American in the incumbent president, but that is why I'm, you know, in fact, telling American, you know, uh, the North Korean analysis that uh, either way, you know, North Korea got to deal with President Trump. Then North Korea got to cooperate with President Trump. Okay. Okay. We have twi time for one last. One last. Yes. Right over here. Okay. Well, I, I can't avoid the former U.S. ambassador, so we'll take both of your questions. <laughs> Hi, Elias Grohl, Foreign Korea. Policy Magazine. Um, Steve Began this morning was very candid about the uh, fundamental obstacle of a lack of a shared definition regarding uh, denuclearization. What's your assessment of the prospect of arriving at a shared definition, and uh, what does that shared definition look like in your mind? I agree with Ambassador Lidon's you know, statement. There is agreement in complete, complete denuclearization. Complete means de denuclearization means what? You know, complete denuclearization of a nuclear facilities, materials, and bombs, and delivery vehicles, period. But there is a difference on the method of this denuclearizing, the steps and stages. Therefore, I really don't think that North Korean leader has a different view on the definition of complete denuclearization. But it's obviously, you know, as was discussed, that North Korea will be trying to retain at least some nuclear bombs uh, to the last moment of negotiation, okay? But it, that seems to be a very natural strategy on the part of North Korea. But we should get rid of those last, uh, you know, elements of nuclear weapons capabilities through dialogue and negotiation. That is our mandate.
But as to definition of complete denuclearization, I really don't think there is a difference among parties concerned. Okay. And Ambassador Sandy Vershbow, former uh, U.S. ambassador to South Korea, now the Atlantic Council. Thanks for that nice introduction. <laughs> uh, uh, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, at Hanoi it seemed that Kim Jong-un's priority was sanctions relief, but then subsequently he said, well, I, what we really want is security guarantees, which I tend to agree with. That raises the question, you know, how much economic leverage do we really have to influence his choices? I, is economic support, relief from sanctions, really that important? Or is Kim Jong-un actually afraid of opening up his economy and reforming because of the risks that this could unravel his control uh, over the country? It would, would undermine the regime, sort of the, what, what happened to Gorbachev. When I was in Pyongyang in September last year, I had a chance to talk with very senior officials and just ordinary guide, who are, which who are the members of the Korea Workers' Party, they're not afraid of opening. You know? What they want is economic prosperity. Okay? But really, let me tell you one interesting phenomenon. When I attended the first summit in 2000 and second summit 2007 as a special delegate, wherever we go, you know, like uh, May 1st stadium, 100,000 North Korean citizens show up, half of them military soldiers. Pyongyang, Greater Pyongyang Theater, half of them the soldiers. When we have uh, luncheons and dinners hosted by Chairman Kim Jong-il, okay, all the key actors were military. But last year, no soldiers at all. You know? the May 1st the stadium, I couldn't see any soldiers in uniform. Great Pyongyang Theater, I never saw any soldiers in uniform. And the most important thing is when I went to Mangyongde, Youth Palace and uh, young you know, kids you know, did the performance. Their slogans, I have never seen the regime related slogan, what the Supreme Leader related slogan. What this chanting is this We want strong and rich nation. We want peace and prosperity. Okay? Let us learn from the, you know, Liamyang Street, that's the most prosperous street with high rise building in Pyongyang. And also, science and technology. It's a completely different setting. Given all this, my observation, in my, I might be an inductivist, but given my observations, I think you know, uh, North Korea is not afraid of opening and reform. That is why I have been arguing they got with some flexible and strategic uh, use of you know, sanctions rather than sanction for the sake of sanctions. Dr. Moon, thank you very much for coming this afternoon. We very much appreciate it. Please join me in thanking Dr. Moon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Mm -hmm. As I understand it, there's a very short break, I believe. And then please come back or stay in your seats because there's going to be an excellent discussion looking at Korea and Korea's role vis-a-vis -vis China and the U U U.S. and its strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you.
um, he's a scholar, yes. so um, we ask him to be a sincere. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second panel for the Atlantic Council East Asia Foundation Strategic Dialogue. My name is Mia No. I'm the director of the Asia Security Initiative in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here at the Atlantic Council. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to take this time to introduce our distinguished panelists who are able to join us today. To my left, we have Professor Huang Jae Huang, Huang Jae Ho Huang. Dr. Huang is a director of the Global Security Cooperation Center at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies in Seoul. Professor Huang also served as a member of the advisory board for the National Security Office and previously served as an advisory member for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Congressman Ik Pyo Hong, Dr. Hong is a member of the Korean National Assembly and the chief spokesperson for the Democratic Party of Korea. Dr. Hong cur currently serves as a vice chairman of the Public Administration and Security Committee for the National Assembly. Prior to serving in the National Assembly, Congressman Hong served as a policy advisor to the Ministry of Unification in Korea. Dr. Jim Miller. Dr. Miller served as the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2012 to 14 and the Principal Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 12. Dr. Miller also previously served as Senior Vice President and Director of Studies at the Center for a New American Security, CNAS, from 2007 to 8. We have Congresswoman Sun Suk Park. Ms. Park is a member of the Korean National Assembly and a member of the Baren Mide Party. Congresswoman Park cu currently served as a member of the Science, ICT, Future Planning, Broadcasting, and Communications Committee. Ms. We have um, Frank Kramer. Mr. Kramer has previously served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs for President Clinton and as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Se Security Affairs. Mr. Kramer is also a Board of Directors and Distinguished Fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much again. And we would like, to, uh, we would like today's panel to be an opportunity to talk U.S.-China strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific 
U.S. vision for the region, and how allies like South Korea can work together with the U.S. in the region. The U.S. vision for the free and open in the Pacific remains an evolving, multi-dimensional concept. And um, recently, the <coughs> Depart Department of Defense released a report, Indo-Pacific Strategy Report, which further articulates the vision since um, the National Security Strategy and the National Defense Strategy were originally published. The recent report laid out four principles for the vision. One, respect for sovereignty and independence of all nations. Two, peaceful resolution of dispute. Three, free, fair, and reciprocal trade based on open investment, transparent agreement, and connectivity. And finally, for adherence to international rules and norms, including those of freedom of navigation and overflight. For each of these principles, the U.S. Um, seeks to work with its partners and allies to maintain what the report calls a safe, secure, prosperous, and free region that benefits all nations. But at the same time, the strategy report identifies China as a revisionist power that continues to pose a significant military and economic challenge to the regional and international system. To date, um, Korean government has been largely silent on this policy toward the Indo-Pacific, although the new southern policy seems to overlap in meaningful ways with the Indo-Pacific region. So this topic um, raises many important questions. How can the United States and Korea work together in revitalizing the rules-based international order in the Indo-Pacific? How can the U.S. and like-minded countries including Korea, best contribute to security, prosperity, and democratic values in the region and around the globe. How are the two countries going to deal with a more confident and assertive China? For the Republic of Korea, it seems this intensifying U.S.-China strategic competition remains a key obstacle to engaging with its longtime ally, the United States, on the free and open in the Pacific. With this in mind, I'd like to ask um, our panelists to share your views and suggestions on the U.S. policy toward the Indo-Pacific strategy. I'd like to begin our panel with initial remarks. Um, and um, since we have a large panel today, I'd like to um, remind each of you to keep remarks to five to seven minutes. And then we'll be starting with Dr. Huang, who will be serving a scene setter for our discussion sharing his insights on how the region understands the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and his policy recommendations for Korea's role in the Indo-Pacific. Dr. Huang, stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oh. It's my great honor to be invited to speak uh, to this very prestigious conference today. Uh, thank you for kind invitation. Um, uh, as the title suggests, uh, I, I would like to share my understanding on the Indo-Pacific first, then uh, the, uh, the role of Korea. In fact, the American need uh, for Indo-Pacific stems from uh, the rise of Chinese power. Uh, Indo-Pacific represents the contradiction. Uh, Indo-Pacific signals the Chinese power has overcome the Asia-Pacific on the one hand, and it cannot contain China with Asia-Pacific alone, on the other hand. Uh, the word contradiction in Chinese is a uh, 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 meaning spear and a shield. Uh, a Chinese man uh, uh, sold his spear and shield at the marketplace. Uh, he said his spear could break any shield, and uh, his shield could block any uh, spears. A bystander asked, why don't you break your shield with your spear? Uh, the U.S. shield of Indo-Pacific is trying to stop uh, the Chinese spear to advance west using the Belt Road Initiative. Uh, it could maintain its consistency uh, as long as there is enough political will and financial uh, budget. If China succeeds in defeating the American efforts to contain the Chinese we might have to discuss new term, Atlantic Pacific strategy in the future, uh, just like uh, the name of the institution, Atlantic Council. Uh, I had a chance to listen to uh, the vision for uh, Indo-Pacific from the acting 
uh, Secretary of Defense at Shangri-La Dialogue a few weeks ago, I could feel the anger of the Americans from his speech. Uh, it is not hard to understand the rise of anger among the Americans. Uh, the U.S. has established the post-war uh, order, revitalized the Western Europe and Japan, uh, supported the reforming and opening of China, uh, and contributed to development of many uh, underdeveloped countries in the last 70 years. Uh, however, uh, the American economy suffers, let alone the international community uh, criticizing America uh, rather than showing appreciation for their accomplishment. Uh, America seems to feel hurt and underappreciated. Uh, the level of anger felt among the Americans rise. Uh, many, country, uh, many countries decided to avoid Trump uh, uh, rather than confront him head on. Uh, we will have uh, uh, to give uh, more time to see uh, if Trump is the uh, symptom of the U.S. retrogress or a chance for its uh, significant reprogress. Uh, for now, uh, everyone is accepting the American leadership uh, habitually, uh, but if the Trump style is normalized, uh, uh, is to, uh, leadership is to be normalized, uh, then we will be faced with uh, uh, the whole new situation. Uh, I'm seeing the rise of nuns from now on. Uh, James White, uh, an American pastor, uh, wrote a book entitled The Rise of the Nuns. Uh, nuns, in his context, signifies those do not belong to any specific uh, religion. Uh, in America, uh, where people were asked to mark uh, their religion on a survey, uh, and if they were a religious, they would tick on the box next to a uh, nuns. It is reported uh, more and more people declare themselves as nuns, uh, and it explains uh, current international relations. Overall, uh, America first created havoc in the world order. If America hopes to maintain the superpower status while behaving like an average power, uh, then it should give up its dominant position in the world order. Uh, if America fails to demonstrate the leadership it did uh, in the 20th century, then the nuns would become uh, the majority. If the nuns uh, were to seek new leadership while no uh, alternative uh, is present, uh, the world would become multipolar. If America to show the leadership of reconciliation, uh, healing, tolerance, uh, but shows that of division, uh, uh, hostility, and ignorance, we will live in the era of America uh, wild, wild west. Uh, this is the biggest contradiction faced, not only in the Asia-Pacific, but also in the Pacific and regions beyond. Uh, now I would like to share my views uh, for cha uh, charting the Korea's role. Uh, first, uh, Korea will actively implement the global uh, values. Korea highly uh, 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 values American contributions and sacrifice that distributed the important uh, values for human, uh, humanity. Uh, Korea uh, will be a useful, successful uh, story of realizing American vision in terms of relationship with uh, Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, second, uh, Korea will continue to support the American leadership. Americans should, pride, uh, uh, should feel pride in the current uh, hardship since it is the result of uh, its contribution to world peace and prosperity. Uh, Korea will be a, a, a good friend that worries about the uh, U.S. Uh, and help the U.S. to regain its confidence. Uh, Korea is the country that makes a, friend, a friendly atmosphere and creates a chance for a cooperation, whether it is in the Pacific Ocean or uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, third, uh, Korea will offer sincere advice for the uh, U.S. The current slogan of Indo-Pacific is free and open. Uh, Korea will contribute the vision and characteristics of Indo-Pacific, which is welcomed by international community. Uh, fourth, uh, Korea will help with actions, not just the word, words. 
uh, Korea would share the uh, substantial burden alongside the United States. Uh, Korea is already providing uh, the bigger financial support for the USFK and has participated in the FTA uh, renegotiation process. Uh, Korea can uh, actively support America's built act with new southern diplomacy. Uh, let me briefly uh, elaborate what is uh, the, the new southern diplomacy. In 2017, uh, President Moon unveiled uh, new southern diplomacy with the aim of elevating its relationship with uh, ASEAN and India uh, uh, to uh, to the level of South Korea's uh, South Korea relationship with the other four uh, regional countries such as U.S., Japan, uh, China, uh, and Russia. Uh, fifth, uh, Korea will play a positive role between the U.S. and China. Uh, Korea can find a connecting point for the Belt Road Initiative and Indo-Pacific economically, as well as uh, persuade China to adhere to the rule-based uh, order. Also, uh, Korea will actively support the uh, uh, United States in its own Korean way. Uh, considering Korea's most uh, vulnerable geographic uh, and strategic positions among allies of U.S. in Asia, uh, even if Korea uh, finalizes its political decision not in the last minute but last second, it doesn't propose, uh, a po uh, it doesn't post a point and or neglect the necessary decisions. In conclusion, uh, the U.S. should uh, have faith in the sincerity of Korea and support its actions. Uh, for Korea, uh, economic material interest is important, but uh, philosophical and justifiable interests are more, uh, all also important. Uh, Korea will be a positive force for the U.S. leadership and U.S.-China relationship and for the international uh, society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Huang. And now I, um, I'd like to turn to Congressman Hong. Would you like to share your remarks? Yeah, Korea, I think I'm going to prepare some of the remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you. Ms. Ik Pyo Hong from Korea. Today, we are talking about the U.S.-China strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific region. I think it's a great honor for me to be able to sit uh, at this panel to have this discussion on this topic. I believe that we need to look at the fundamental issue here. The Indo-Pacific region has risen rapidly recently, and I believe that this had to do with the President Obama's a pivot policy, uh, and this has gone beyond the Pacific region to include the, the Indian uh, Ocean region. Uh, no matter what name you put to this initiative, I believe that this is the effort of the U.S. to check rising China and probably taking a step further to contain China, uh, regardless of what intentions there would be. Uh, in this strategy, I believe that that is the understanding of China and uh, that is the understanding that could be shared by many other Asian countries. Uh, this is the fundamental question, uh, the relations between China and the U.S. Actually, if you look at the recent relations between these two countries, it's not just about trade disputes. It's m also about the hegemonic power struggle. The U.S. and China, these two countries, uh, need to figure out whether they are an enemy or a partner to each other. Uh, they need to make a judgment uh, on that. Uh, maybe they could be somewhere in between. Depending on where you focus, on which aspect of the relationship, maybe a strategy uh, will become different. Uh, whether the U.S. will view China as a partner or an enemy. And that is the type of decision that you need to make. Or is it your objective to change China? Or is it your goal to cooperate with China to maintain stable global order? Uh, maybe that is another decision that you need to make. Depending on the decision that you make, I believe that in the Indo-Pacific region, the relations between the two countries will be determined and shaped. 
As was already pointed out by Dr. O, uh, according to the 2017 National Security Strategy Report, uh, China and Russia were defined and identified as a revisionist powers. Especially, China was seen as a strategic competitor. And in Asia, uh, China was viewed as trying to replace uh, the U.S. in the Asian region. That was already included in the National Security Strategy Report. In the Pacific region, the U.S., Japan, India, and Australia, a quadrilateral gathering is being proposed. As you already know, Australia is already an ally to the U.S. So what is a variable here is India, whether India would be willing to become an ally to the U.S. I believe uh, that would be central to this strategy in the Indo-Pacific region. And beyond these four countries, uh, if uh, would the U.S. be able to include other East Asian countries in this community? Uh, I believe that depending on whether they will be able to do that, the ultimate uh, success of the strategy will be determined. Uh, as a matter of fact, China is calling this uh, effort to form a quadrilater quadrilateral gathering as an attempt to create an Asian version of NATO, and that is why they are venting strong opposition. But I would like to point out some of the limitations of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy or initiative. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, Japan and Australia are already allies of the U.S. And, and we have to see whether India will give up on their traditional foreign policy of non-alignment and join the alliance of the U.S. At this moment, uh, India is taking a very ambiguous position on this matter. And we also need to think about the other ASEAN countries. Uh, maybe uh, most willing to do it is Singapore, because they share the democratic and market economy values with the US. Uh, Singapore may, might be most uh, proactive. Uh, however, if you look at the stature of Singapore in the East Southeast Asian country region, uh, it doesn't have a significant status, because it's such a small city state. And another very promising partner could be Vietnam, because Vietnam is currently in conflict with China because of the territorial disputes in the South China Sea. So, however, it will be probably difficult for Vietnam to publicly join uh, this initiative of the U.S. Then what else? Uh, Myanmar and Cambodia, uh, they are the countries who are traditionally close to China, so they are taking an ambiguous position as well. Uh, what about the Philippines? Uh, I believe that they will do the same. They will remain ambiguous. Realistically speaking, in East Asia, uh, the choice of the majority nations would probably not bandwagoning on the U.S. side. Uh, probably they will remain ambiguous and be strategic. The U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, I believe uh, it will, the success of it will be largely determined by the participation of India and other countries, and that remains uncertainty at this moment. And countries in this region are geographically very close to China, and they are highly dependent on China for economy. As you might be well aware, uh, AIIB has been established, established by China, and via AIIB, China has been providing substantial economic assistance to countries in the region. And uh, do you think it will be possible for the U.S. to provide the same level of uh, incentives uh, to these countries? I don't believe it will be easy for the U.S. to do so. Uh, China is taking the Belt and Road Initiative, and under that initiative, they're trying to create links uh, between infrastructure in the region, and this will be driven by China. Then how will the U.S. check this? And it, does the U.S. have the financial capacity to do so, to make the same level of investment? Realistically, it seems unfeasible. If this is the case, because uh, to give you the conclusion first, I believe that there could be three choices that could be made by South Korea uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, I would like to first let you know that this is my personal opinion, not representing my party position. The second is delinking. 
the first, the the third option is multilateralism, and I'd like to touch upon the first element as well. Given the geographical location of South Korea and other issues that we are facing with vis-a-vis -vis China, for instance, we've experienced tremendous difficulties because of the third deployment on the Korean Peninsula uh, that was caused by China. So for us to prevent this same situation from recurring, then we need to uh, preemptively take actions to avoid such risks. So for us, I think the worst case scenario would be uh, being placed in a situation where we we'll, where would we'll have to choose between China and the U.S. So we need to take preemptive actions to avoid uh, uh, that situation. At the same time, the Korean Peninsula issues and the Indo-Pacific strategy issues, uh, these two elements should be delinked. Uh, they should not be linked. The ROG-US alliance has been playing its a share of role over the years, and we value the ROG US alliance. And in Northeast Asia, uh, this has been a long standing traditional ally relationship. But this ROG US alliance. If it's going to expand to cover other parts of Asia, I believe that could be problematic. We need to have a strategic dialogue with the U.S. Uh, and rethink about that attempt, if there's any. And the North Korean issue, Korean Peninsula issue, and the rock us alliance issue, uh, all of these issues should be treated separately uh, from the U.S.'s strategy in the Indo-Pacific region. And lastly, uh, there could be a multilateral approach uh, that we could take. Between China and the U.S., uh, there is this bilateral relations. And we need to think about another bilateral relations between the U.S. and South Korea. Are we talking about the U.S.-South Korea relations or the U.S.-China relations? Uh, apart from these bilateral relations, we could think about in about multilateral relations. Uh, there could be members of the ASEAN, and uh, there could be a plus three countries, which include South Korea, China, and Japan, in addition to ASEAN. Historically, politically, there have not been much, there hasn't been much progress that's made in this trilateral uh, relationship. As I mentioned previously, there are ASEAN countries and there are plus three countries, and we might uh, probably have to take a multilateral approach covering all these countries uh, so that we can maintain peace in the region. So that will be our strategic choice, and that is a choice that we need to make on the part of South Korea. So I believe that that will be the best uh, choice uh, on the part of on the part of the South Koreans. Uh, to repeat myself, uh, the relations between the U.S. and China. You need to define your relationship. We call China and the U.S. as G2. Uh, instead of uh, remaining as G2, so you can become coordination and cooperation partners. Uh, you could define your relationship as C2, uh, coordination and cooperation. Uh, that will be more beneficial for the entire global community, and not just for both sides. As such, uh, I believe that it is critical to try to uh, redefine their strategic uh, relationship in a, a more coordinated manner. Uh, that is something that should be driven by the opinion leaders uh, in the U.S. Uh, if you can do that, uh, countries in East Asia, including South Korea, will be able to join that effort to find the right solution for all. The Indo-Pacific region uh, should not become the region of military confrontation. It should become the region of peace. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Um, I want to talk about some specific areas of U.S.-Chinese uh, competition and the possible role of South Korea within each of those. But before doing so, I wanted to make couple of broad comments. The first is that I think many Americans at least see the U.S.-Chinese relationship as one that has very significant areas of cooperation, and certainly where coordination is required uh, to cooperate effectively, but also it's a second category of competition where coordination is, if anything, even more important. 
uh, there's the potential for a third C, or a fourth with yours, uh, of conflict. And we, we need to work, and we need to work to ensure that that does not occur. So, but that's a, just a broad framing. But I think it's important to understand the extent to, to which the US, China, and South Korea have extremely strong common interests. And just remind ourselves of some of the, some of the facts on this. First, on the trading front, um, uh, China is the largest US trading partner. The US is China's largest trading partner. China is the largest export market for South Korea. The US is number two, all right? China is number one for South Korean imports. The US is number three. So the, uh, our economies are extremely intertwined. Uh, we have a high degree of dependency, and there is a tremendous common interest in, in continued sustained trade. All three countries also have extremely strong interest in peace, not just on the peninsula, uh, but in the region and globally. And we have a strong interest not just to avoid an ex expanded trade war, but certainly to ab avoid any actual conflict as well. So that's, it, I could go on on the common interest and so forth. They're, they're, they're powerful, they're durable, and they're important. On the other side of the ledger from an American perspective, um, the US administration is now pushing back harder on what it sees as unfair Chinese practices. That's unfair trade practices, theft of intellectual property, which the prior administration raised as well, uh, militarization of the South China Sea, the use of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to coerce its neighbors and to, and to gain influence in a way that is inappropriate among nations. And so the predominant US perspective, I think, is that not just that the US needs to push back on these issues, uh, or the US and South Korea, but the international community that cares about the international system operating effectively and fairly, uh, and the system that's benefited all of our countries so much since the end of World War II, that if we don't push back now, and if we don't do so appropriately, we may find ourselves in an unfortunate and dangerous position. Um, and let me just, if, if I could go through five specific areas, uh, where that competition and a degree of friction is occurring today, and I'll do so in each one of them relatively quickly. Uh, first is the theft of intellectual property. National Security Advisor Bolton said just two or three days ago that the United States will be turning up the dial in the use of offensive cyber capabilities to deal with the theft of intellectual proper property. And he drew uh, a, an analogy to the actions reportedly taken by the United States Cyber Command to deal with Russian intervention or attempted uh, information operations in the US 2018 election. So the National Security Advisor says we're gonna do more on theft of intellectual property. Cyber will be one of the tools. And uh, that will be an important area for the US and South Korea to discuss. I'm not proposing that South Korea engage uh, uh, or focus on engaging on offensive cyber operations. I'm suggesting that it's important that the United States communicate in, in general terms, what it's attempting to accomplish uh, uh, if, if and as it goes forward, and that that be part of a broader US, South Korean, and international strategy to combat the theft of intellectual property. And that strategy can include diplomacy, economic steps, if necessary, sanctions. Uh, but naming and shaming uh, are certainly part of it. So that's one category. Uh, the second category I wanted to mention is somewhat related, and that's the posture of, on information technology, technology, Huawei, ZTE, in the news today, particularly Huawei. The United States government has made the argument that Huawei is attempting to, to position itself to be able to not just provide services at, uh, at more cheaply, which is part of competition, and the US doesn't like that it's subsidized, but we understand absent an agreement otherwise that, that will occur but it will position itself also to spy, and it position itself to cut off services, and that it may operate at the, at the direction of the Chinese government, and so doing in the event of a crisis or political con conflict. Um, that's a very tough uh, uh, line by the United States. I personally believe it's credible, uh, and I hope that the president, President Trump, will articulate a consistent view on this. He's, he's uh, having the president say, 
uh, that this, this might be an issue that could be traded away as part of a trade negotiation with China undermines the, the credibility of the argument uh, and undermines its importance. And again, uh, I understand that, that South Korea is going forward with Huawei in important, in important areas, including one of its three major, major telecoms. Uh, I understand that the two of the telecoms are relying heavily on Samsung, Ericsson, Nokia, and having that diversity should provide a little bit of a hedge. And what I hope that we can do uh, in working together on this issue uh, is have frank conversations about the nature of the threat, ways to make insecure networks more secure. Uh, and I hope that South Korea will look uh, at the British model where it's, it's said it's not going to use Huawei gear uh, for its core uh, IT infrastructure for those elements of government and emergency communications that it absolutely can't live without. So there, I think there's a, there's a, a, a pathway here. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative for topic number three. Our perception, that, and I speak for many Americans anyhow, uh, is, that the, is that China is both acting as a great power and as great powers do in expanding their influence through Belt and Road Initiative but also using coercive practices uh, and unfair uh, leverage in negotiations to get terms uh, uh, that, the, that the other side can't deal with. I don't, I don't claim that this has happened with respect to South Korea because South Korea is a bigger player and a more effective negotiator. But with a number of other countries, they've made terms such that when the country can't meet the interest payments and so forth, so forth China has taken a significant control. I know that South Korea will be careful in its, in its choices of how to engage in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and ensure that China does not get unfair economic leverage over the South Korea or its companies. And I hope that the new Southern policy and approach uh, in partnership with steps the United States is taking in the region as well uh, will, show, will allow South Korea and in, in cases of mutual interest and, and efficiency, U.S. as well, to move forward in areas of transportation, energy, resources, so that China, while China is a, is a big player, it's not the only player in this space, and that a degree of competition can take place. And on the question of free trade zones, my personal view is that U.S. and South Korea both made the wrong choice mm -hmm. in not going forward with TPP. I know there are, will be many who disagree with that, uh, uh, or now the, the comprehensive and progressive TPP. CPTPP. The U.S. may or much more likely may not agree to join the CTPP, CPTPP. Uh, first, we have to be able to say it, right? Uh, uh, I don't think this administration will. I think it's very unlikely that a Democratic administration that followed either this, this term or next term for President Trump would do so. But I do hope that South Korea gets ahead on this issue and, and does move forward the, with the CPTPP uh, on terms that make sense for it. I can't promise that the United States will come to its census on this issue, uh, but, but the chances of the U.S. doing so is better if South Korea goes forward as well. And the fifth area I wanted to talk about, there are many more, but just in the interest of time, is, is the military competition. Uh, China is rapidly building its military. Its military budget has grown about 10 percent a year for the last decade plus. That is the national choice for China. That doesn't cause me any loss of sleep. Uh, the, the U.S. has a much larger military budget and very capable military. And we have powerful allies, powerful in the sense of not just their military, but our mutual commitment. So the, the things that worry me are things with which I know the, the panelists and others are familiar. China's building out of infrastructure in the South China Sea after President Xi made a direct commitment that they would not do so. The uh, increased harassing of, of ships at sea and, and aircraft in the air that's occurring, and particularly within China's claimed so-called nine-dash line uh, and so forth. And here, I, I'm very pleased when I see the U.S., South Korea, and others working together to uh, exert, uh, undertake exercises that exert their rights under freedom of navigation. Uh, when they push back on unsafe practices by the Chinese military, and when they particularly uh, through ASEAN and other menu, uh, venues where we work to try to, to build understood and agreed rules of the road uh, for appropriate behavior and, and to impose costs when those rules aren't followed. 
So these are all areas, five I've discussed, are all areas where there's competition and friction. Uh, none of them uh, uh, looks like it's uh, about to lead to conflict in the near term, but one can foresee how absent the type of, of honest conversation and as you pointed out, sir, coordination as well, that, that these, these could become much more, much more dangerous. Uh, stop uh, uh, following one final comment. We need to understand both that China is a great power and a rising great power. Uh, in other words, it's, it's already in the status of a great power today. Uh, some Americans don't like me to say that. It's a reality and it's rising. The United States is a great power and its best days are not behind it and, uh, uh, and it's not going to achieve its success by looking to the past but by working with its partners and allies to build a new future. Part of that future should be a rules-based and really must be for our own prosperity and that of our children, uh, rules-based international order that we are willing to assert and to impose costs on those who will not follow. Uh, if we want fair trade, not coercion, if we want protection of intellectual property, if we want regional disputes settled peacefully and not by coercion, now is the time to push back and reinforce norms and to do so in a reasoned, measured way and to do so in not as one country here, another country there, but wherever possible in partnership and in, and, 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 and in alliance and not just with formal alliances, but others who support uh, this, this vision of what the international sh system should, should entail, the vision that, we've, that we have in the past fought wars for together. So uh, we share strong economic and national security interests. We share a strong interest in supporting a rules-based international order. Uh, we won't always make the same choices, but we need to continue to work closely together. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Now I'd like to turn to Congresswoman Park. I appreciate all of the comments made by the three panelists. Uh, although there are slight differences, I believe that there is commonality as well in the Indo-Pacific region. Between the U.S. and China, uh, I think all are saying that instead of trying to be coming um, more confrontational, uh, maybe we need to seek a better way. Well, think about last year. There has been this story. If the Chinese people are going to hold their hands together, and on the count of three, if they try to jump up and then come down, then they can make the earth move. If the Americans do that, do you think you'll be able to move the earth? I don't think so. Why? Because American people would never be able to hold their hands all together and jump all together on the count of three. That attests to the fundamental differences between the systems of the U.S. and China in terms of scale, in terms of population, and the geographical coverage. Uh, maybe the U.S. is far ahead, but still, China used to be a communist country, and because of that fact, uh, they have ingrained discipline uh, amongst their people. And that is why China could have substantial uh, power and implications that can impact the rest of the world. Regarding this destructive power of China, potentially, uh, I believe that the U.S. has a lot to think about. The Belt and the Road Initiative was mentioned, and the U.S.'s response to the Belt and Road Initiative of China, I thought, was the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy. China has been expanding its influence in the digital domain, uh, and uh, as a response to that, I believe that there are, uh, now we are seeing a, this trade dispute between the U.S. and China. Uh, to put things in good terms, 
It's a matter of how we're going to induce China and bring it into a harmonious world order. And at the same time, the U.S. needs to think about how it can harmoniously coexist with China. Uh, maybe this is something that's unrealistic to implement uh, if the Americans uh, hold their hands all together and jump all at the same time, you can still uh, shake the earth. Uh, the Indians would not be able to do so. Uh, the U.S. has changed the Pacific Command into the Indo-Pacific Command. Why the change? Why is the U.S. paying attention to India all of a sudden or the Indo Indian Ocean? Uh, Maybe it has to do with the fact that the U.S. is trying to respond to the rising China. Then what about the South Korean government position on this? South Korea is an ally to the U.S. And as the U.S. is ally, we have been supportive of the U.S.'s efforts to engage in the region. If the U.S is uh, going to pursue uh, peace in the region. According to the Indo-Pacific Strategy Report uh, announced by the DOD of the US, that was announced in June, uh, if you read the report, I believe that the US seems to be trying to define China uh, as a force, a revisionist state, uh, indicating that the US is trying to check and contain China. And the report is also emphasizing the importance of cooperating uh, with partners and allies uh, who are willing to maintain uh, a free region. As a matter of fact, a de facto NATO, maybe the U.S. is trying to create a de facto new version of NATO in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this report invites such questions, and that is the claim and the interpretation of the China regarding this report. So China is raising these questions and issues. And even then, the U.S. is still trying to uh, pursue this strategy, which I believe is not wise on the part of the U.S. To raise one issue, I wonder whether the U.S. is trying to pursue bilateral relations, for instance, the alliance between the U.S. and South Korea and other allies. Uh, are you trying to cement these bilateral relations, or are you trying to create a multilateral, another multilateral alliance? And to borrow the expressions, is it about create a military alliance that's aimed at maintaining a free region in the Indo-Pacific region? This is a question that's posed to the U.S. Because if you are going to have a multilateral alliance, then you need to have a common threat and common enemy. Then does, does this mean that a common enemy is either North Korea, China, or Russia? If we are not going to assume these common enemies and still trying to uh, form an alliance, then what is the purpose of forming such an alliance? If such multilateral alliance is to be formed, especially on the assumption that uh, you are uh, standing against uh, North Korea, China, and Russia. And if you are trying to pursue a military alliance, then as a member of the National Assembly, uh, I would voice my opposition to that idea that it's better for South Korea not to join that alliance because the U.S. has been emphasizing the principles of inclusiveness. And such a uh, multilateral military alliance would come directly into conflict with that principle. And Korean Peninsula is the last part of the world that still has the vestiges of the Cold War. And if we are to participate in that uh, alliance, then uh, the Cold War on the Korean Peninsula would become permanent. And that is why we cannot uh, join that idea. Uh, South Korean people uh, hoped 
to be able to settle the legacy of the Cold War on the Korean Peninsula, and we want a peaceful Korean Peninsula in the future. And of course, there will be many obstacles to overcome until we can ultimately achieve this vision. And of course, the North Korean nuclear issue has would have to be resolved. But this dream is something that we cannot give up on. These, so we do have such concerns. And these concerns probably it can be addressed by the U.S.'s explanation uh, regarding the clear uh, intentions that is behind the Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. government. Um, regarding the comments made by Mr. Jim Miller, I would like to uh, make some additional comments. As I stated in my opening, uh, we are talking about the Indo-Pacific strategy, and we are also talking about the anti-Huawei alliance. Maybe they it might appear to be two separate issues, but they do they are uh, linked in certain ways. Uh, Mr. Jim Miller talked about the information technology and its security concerns, but uh, to make one correction. Of the three uh, carriers in Korea, you've mentioned that one of such carriers are using Huawei technology. But to be more accurate, of the three carriers in Korea, they have introduced uh, Huawei uh, technology for 20 percent of their technology for 4G. So they have been providing 4G services. Uh, and just for 20% of that, oh, we have introduced Huawei equipment. As a matter of fact, Huawei has been uh, trying to penetrate into the Korean market based on low prices. And I do not believe that the US can make a demand uh, on South Korea to take measures against that. I fully understand the concerns on the part of the U.S. I know what you are worried about. Uh, China has been pursuing the Belt and the Road Initiative and also Made in China 2025 strategy. And China's economic expansion has been very substantial. And at this time, China uh, may not be in full compliance with the international law and norms. And I believe that it is right for the U.S. and the rest of the international community to demand that China follow such international norms. But such a demand uh, should be made uh, through appropriate uh, processes. Regarding the Huawei issues, I believe that there has been certain differences uh, in responses uh, made by the UK government and the US government. The UK government has been uh, working together with Huawei uh, for four years now to study the technology security concerns of Huawei equipment and technology. They have been issuing uh, four uh, reports so far. The most recent one being the fourth report. And in the latest report, some security concerns have been raised regarding Huawei technology. What is important is as follows, that Huawei technology does have some security flaws. But the report concluded that they could not determine th that the Chinese government was intervening in that aspect. That was the conclusion of the report. I believe that you need to have that type of conclusion to be able to hold Huawei responsible for security concerns. In the case of South Korea, in October of last year, we called the managing director of the Huawei Korea office before a hearing of the National Assembly. And we were able to ask questions to the uh, GM of the Korean office regarding certain security concerns that we could identify uh, 
regarding their technologies. Samsung, Ericsson, Nokia, and Huawei, all of uh, those companies' technologies, security aspects are being monitored. And I believe that if somebody is going to raise an issue, uh, that a party needs uh, to bear the burden of proof. As such, whether or not you are participating in an anti-Huawei alliance uh, should not be the indicator of how loyal you are as an ally to the US. Uh, let me add one more comment myself. China uh, could be threatening uh, Korean companies and The U.S. is pressuring the Blue House. Uh, that was the headline of one of the major conservative uh, newspapers in Korea. In Korea, there is severe gap in opinions uh, between conservative and progressive uh, camps. And now, even the conservative camps in South Korea is viewing uh, the U.S. pressure uh, as being applied to the Blue House regarding Huawei technology. So this is something that you need to be cautious about. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed all those presentations. I want to take a somewhat different view, and I'm going to try to do something that I'm going to ask my panelists to forgive me for. I'm going to try to look at this uh, from what I think should be Korea's perspective, even though I'm an American. Um, and I may make significant mistakes, uh, but I'll do my best. Now, the first thing I would say is that if you do look at this from a Korean perspective, I think that the title of the session is not the right title. It shouldn't be Korea's role uh, with respect to U.S.-China strategic competition it really ought to be what should be Korea's strategic behavior in a multi-vector and a very dynamic Indo-Pacific. Um, the second thing I would say is it's not about alliances then. It's about behaviors, about strategies, uh, about overall approaches. Alliances are part, but they are not the whole. So where I would start, uh, I would say, putting my Korean hat on, and I I visited the country often enough, so you'll forgive me. Um, what, what does the Indo-Pacific look like? Uh, and I would say uh, one way to look at it is say there are what I would call three groupings. They're not alliances, they're just groupings. Uh, one is the groupings of what I would call the democratic free market countries. Uh, obviously, Korea is part of that, uh, Japan, Philippines, Indonesia, Australia, India and across the Pacific, Canada and the U.S. It's not an alliance, it's not even necessarily working together, but it's just a group of countries that have mutual common interest in democracy, free market, common values. Uh, a second grouping, I think, uh, broadly speaking, uh, is what you might call it the, the ASEANs. Uh, uh, all uh, important, uh, Vietnam has uh, particular significance in the trade area for uh, Korea, of course. Uh, I put Indonesia in the first group, but it's also in the second group, which just shows you the uh, multi-factor uh, approach that I think about when I think of the Indo-Pacific. The third group I would call China. Um, in the Indo-Pacific, I think one of the things that's important to say is that there's no single institution uh, that's a place to work out strategic issues of any kind, whether they're trade or security or, or otherwise. Um, there are multiple institutions. There are obviously the alliances with the U.S., and I have worked on that uh, for, for a long time. Um, and I quite agree, uh, the ROK and the U.S. are, are very good allies, uh, and I think we will continue to be so, and we heard uh, earlier with respect to uh, some of the speakers uh, why that's true. Uh, the second set of institutions come out of ASEAN and related sets of it, you know, uh, activities, the East Asia Summit and the like. Um, uh, the, as Jim said, the CPTPP, uh, which neither uh, or none of, I should say, China or the U.S. or Korea have, uh, are in, but nonetheless important. Um, but there are multiple bilateral sets of activities, uh, the U.S., uh, Korea, 
a free trade agreement, which has been updated about a year ago. Um, all of that suggests to me uh, that what the Indo-Pacific requires is a multi-vector, multi-factor approach. Uh, so I really would like to question people who put the question in terms of alliances. I think that misstates both what the U.S. is trying to do uh, and what countries in the region should be trying to do. But it is true, uh, as all of you have said, uh, that China is quite different than it was, let's just call it 25 years ago. Uh, and, it, and so I think one should ask from the ROK point of view, and again, I'm going to do this as Americans, so bear with me. Uh, from the ROK point of view, seen by me as an outsider, what does China look like? And I think one would look at historic issues. I think one would look at cultural issues. I think one would look at economic issues. And I think one would look at security issues. And the reason I say that is I think it's a very bad idea when thinking strategy to compartmentalize. When you implement, I think you have to compartmentalize and focus. But when you try to take a strategic point of view, I think it's important to include all factors. I'm not sure that I've included all, and certainly in a short presentation won't. Um, but I would say, um, historically, China is an imperialistic nation. Uh, it views itself as the center. Uh, and Xi Jinping has talked about, but so did uh, Hu Jintao and so did Jiang Zemin, about the rejuvenation, that's the word they use, the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. Um, China thinks of itself as dominating. Uh, the ROK saw this, uh, if I remember right, and I looked it up, I believe I was right, in a period of about 15 to 10 years ago, there was a debate over the three kingdoms, right, and the northern kingdom, and I'll mispronounce, but the Goguryeo, uh, whether it was really a Korean kingdom or whether it was really Chinese. Um, in my opinion, there's no question it's Korean. <laughs> but that was not the Chinese opinion, right? Um, so I think that just gives you a sense uh, of where one is historically. Um, culturally, I think it's fair to say that China is anti-democratic. Uh, it's highly nationalistic. It's often not receptive to diplomacy. I think that's exemplified by its rejection of the Law of the Sea Tribunal. Uh, it's the issue on rare earths that have came up a few years ago, uh, bananas with respect to Thailand, and of course that, right? Um, so we have a country that has its own view as to how it responds to things. And I think it's important to, to say that. Uh, economically, uh, obviously, China is quite important. Uh, a number of you pointed out, uh, largest US trade partner, uh, very important, uh, largest uh, ROK trade partner. It's also important to say that's only happened in the last 10 years, really. Uh, so this is not forever. Um, and how to think about that, it's not irrevocable that it stays that way. It's also a competitor moving up the value chain. Now that's perfectly fine, it's legitimate, but I don't think it's legitimate to move up the value chain uh, using forced technology transfer, non-market pricing, um, subsidies, cyber espionage, and the like. Um, so I think those issues need to be thought about. And then from a security point of view, um, and I quite agree that we are all, and I've worked on this, uh, this will tell you how old I am, but I've worked on ROK, uh, uh, DPRK issues since 1977, so I'm as interested as anyone could be in terms of uh, getting to a good conclusion. But I don't think China is as interested in denuclearization as it is interested in maintaining DPRK existence. Um, now, as uh, was mentioned in the earlier uh, lunchtime conversation, there are a variety of ways to nonetheless resolve that, um, and we can talk about that. But I don't think China is, uh, if you will, on the side of the angels. Um, and I think we all recognize that in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, and sometimes with respect to air defense, identity. Uh, identification zones that China is, let's just call it, aggressive. So again, putting on my ROK hat, what, what should be the ROK posture? Well, I think um, one of the things that one ought to think about was to not have an overly great dependence on China. Uh, I think the ROK uh, southern policy and, and uh, the 
policies comparable to that beforehand was very sensible. Uh, worked with many, including especially, I would say, Indonesia and India as major future markets. Worked with Vietnam to expand that. Uh, not, not worked with China, just don't make uh, an over-dependence on it. Uh, the second thing I think is very important is to develop advanced technologies. Um, doing that both at home, and that's something that can be done very working well with close allies. And in that regard, I would strongly encourage uh, working with the United States. There have been some uh, activities here, workshops and otherwise at the Atlantic Council talking about that. But there have been many major companies working together. And I think that's something that we all ought to really think about. And I'm talking about, of course, things like artificial intelligence or robotics or quantum computing or biology, et cetera, all of which the ROK is terrific uh, in. Uh, the third thing, uh, BRI has been mentioned a number of times. Uh, I wouldn't leave infrastructure to the Chinese. Now, in reality, we haven't. Um, there have been major, uh, the international financial institutions have done it for years. Uh, multiple countries have, the United States has, actually Japan has, the ROK has. I just think that we should not act as if BRI is the be all and the end all. Um, it's, it's important, I agree with everything that Jim Miller said. Um, but I think we also have our own sets of activities that we ought uh, to undertake. Now, the fourth thing I would say was we really need to talk about uh, World Trade Organization and other economic reform. And this, I think, is actually the most important thing because I think the key issue really is whether a state-driven economy of the size of China with the kind of government that it has uh, can fairly work with market-driven economies. Um, when China was smaller, it didn't really matter that much. It mattered, but it didn't matter that much. But now it matters a lot. Um, and so now, uh, when China comes in, to just use an example uh, of the Netherlands and Huawei pricing, uh, and this is from the FT, so maybe my numbers are wrong, but they come in 60% below Ericsson. They didn't do that just because uh, they're a lot smarter than Ericsson. They did that because of subsidies and other kinds of uh, capabilities that the government gives them. So how do we bring together uh, in an appropriate way uh, an economic system where we really have systemic incompatibility? Um, but the Chinese are not going away, and I have uh, no concerns at all with looking towards a way to coordinate but I do not think we should naively talk about coordination. We have to think about it really closely, what that actually means. Uh, the fifth thing I would say is that uh, there needs to be, I'm gonna call it coordinated multi-vector security, not alliances. Uh, there are alliances and I would maintain those uh, for the purposes that they exist. Um, but for example, there was a recent US, Japan, Australia, ROK maritime exercise, a good example uh, of multi-vector. Um, I do not think that uh, India is going to become an American ally, but I think we may have many coordinated interests. Um, and I think that's why and the, the US, India sets of activities really relate back, uh, go over 20 years now uh, from the time of uh, Indian nuclear explosions uh, in the, I think it was 98, uh, there's been a, multiple administrations trying to increase uh, close coordination. The last point I would say is there are areas where we really do need to cooperate with China, and I would say the most important by far, and certainly for my children and grandchildren, are, is uh, climate change. Uh, and uh, that is uh, on the top of my list as to things that are key uh, for the world. Uh, we're not going to resolve it without China. We're not going to resolve it without India and other large nations. But China has technological capability that can make a huge difference in the energy area and otherwise. So, um, so what I would say is it's not about choosing sides. It's about picking your values and then undertaking activities that support those values. I think the things that most bring together uh, the ROK and the United States of America are democracy. Uh, I worked on this long enough so that I, I worked uh, when the ROK was not democratic and I must say I applaud the change. Uh, I think it's wonderful. I think free market is critical. Um, and I think figuring out how to work with 
the 1.3 billion people who might jump up all and shake the earth is also critical. But as I said, not in a naive way, uh, but in a way that's smart about it, uh, takes account of things that you said, that Jim Miller said and others, um, and that's, that's my suggestion. So uh, if I got it wrong from the ROK point of view, I apologize, but I thought it might be useful to think about it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all um, for sharing your insightful um, remarks. And I think I have to say that um, this is, we're covering really broad and very complex set of issues. And then 90 minutes is not enough to talk about this issue. Um, so um, as a moderator, I'd like to raise two questions. And then um, in asking, so the first question is on, um, so what do you see, what do you see is the end game of this um, U.S.-China strategic competition, and then we have U.S. elections next year. And uh, we hear from the region um, what's the United States' ultimate goal for its relationship with China. Um, as time goes by, we hear more details on U.S. strategy for the free and open in the Pacific. And I know that some of our panelists has already have already um, responded to this question. So my next one, I'd like to. Um, talk a li little more about Huawei case too, because um, President Trump, um, I'd like to mention this speech, his speech. So he said in Danang in November 2017 that, quote, economic security is national security. Since then, we've seen um, the U.S. government voice increasing in, in concerns about the national security risk um, posed by this Chinese um, tech problems and then what they call. And, um, but then we, and we hear from the Chinese government also, um, as Congresswoman Park mentioned, the Chinese government is putting increasingly um, pressure on major international tech firms, including Samsung, warning them not to cooperate with the US effort. And also that was raised by Dr. Miller. So uh, for those who have not, um, um, cover this issue, I'd like to hear a little bit on this Huawei case, and then um, and to hear your thought on the uh, how U.S. can coordinate with its allies and partners, and then does Korea share similar concern with the United States? So this would be my two questions again, um, so it would be fine to answer one of the two questions um, because um, we're running out of time, and then um, I'd like to take one or two questions from the floor, so I would appreciate your brief comment. Thank you. So anyone would like to start? Frank? So with respect to the ultimate goal, I think the ultimate goal of the United States is precisely what uh, was mentioned, which is to find a way to coordinate with China in such a way that benefits the entire world. But along the way, um, I think there's going to be a fair amount of confrontation. And personally, I think it's going to be very difficult because I think one has to look deeply into what's going on in China. So I think one has to see you know, and pay attention not only to Xi Jinping thought, but what I sometimes call Xi Jinping practice. Um, and I think that the Chinese have understandably felt that they uh, lost out, uh, they call it, uh, you know, the hundred years of uh, humiliation. Um, and they are not um, as self-aware, let me put it this way, as I think they might be, and they are not uh, willing to do things uh, I think that others would expect them to do. And I, I think the cyber espionage example is an example. Uh, there was no doubt whatsoever that there was a pledge uh, to, between Xi and President Obama, uh, and they've not kept up to that. Uh, same with respect to the South China Sea. Uh, they said they would not militarize it, um, and they have. So I think that uh, we, the and I would include countries with close associations, not just because of the bilateral alliance, but because, as I said, of the common values. Uh, 
that we have to understand that. Uh, and so we're going to have to think hard about how to shape Chinese behavior uh, without, um, without creating a conflict, without creating a war. Uh, on Huawei, I think the uh, thing to be said, and, and the Congressman uh, very accurately states what the uh, UK report said, um, a lot of people say, well, there's no smoking gun. Well, that's, in my opinion, entirely beside the point. Um, and the reason it's beside the point is because if you put the system into place, and given the Chinese system, and a lot of people refer to the law in China, um, <laughs> I think the reality is more important than the law, um, the Chinese government has the capability to force Huawei to do things. So uh, in the first instance, there's the issue of potential espionage, which I think we all know that China's undertaking anyway in a significant way. So this would just add to that. And in the second instance, there's the potential for disruption in an appropriate, what they deem an appropriate case. And we've seen disruptive activities. So I think that uh, using Huawei for economic reasons makes the compartmentalization mistake that I referred to, uh, that one needs to look at the entirety. Um, that doesn't mean you can't use Huawei at all. Uh, in my opinion, that would be the better solution. Um, but it's not because of a boycott, it's because of national security interests of the country. But every country gets to make its own decisions. But I do think that there is a uh, high risk uh, uh, in putting Huawei in the core uh, of, a, of a telecommunication system. Uh, the National Assembly of South Korea, uh, I told you, that has done certain things regarding the use of Huawei equipment. We believe that uh, we need to be very cautious, and we have been pointing out technological uh, issues concerning Huawei technology, as was mentioned by two gentlemen here. Uh, the matter of information and telecommunications ne network uh, is a matter that is very important. Uh, whether it's Huawei's or Nokia's or Samsung's so, uh, regarding the security guarantee uh, of these technologies, uh, there can be nothing like 100% uh, security guarantee. Once uh, there's a filtration into the system, then there will be a disaster. There is this law that's passed in China recently, and the Chinese government is now entitled to ask private companies to uh, cooperate in their uh, certain, in doing, conducting certain intelligence activities, which is causing a greater concern. I believe that maybe for us to try to apply the rules of the global market, uh, it is time for China to uh, take certain measure, measures internally uh, and uh, wrap things up a little uh, to make sure that they are in compliance. Uh, uh, please tell the speaker to use the microphone. State-driven economy and market-driven economy are the two things that have been repeatedly mentioned and emphasized, and uh, China stands as the advocate on the one hand, and uh, while U.S. is driving the market-driven economy on the other, as you know very well, capitalism is being defined and is being redefined. The role of the market and the role of the state in the market, how can we really define it? It's been constantly changed. We cannot really be like uh, pursuing a dichotomy, whether it is exclusively market or state-driven. I don't think it is any easy, but the real matter of importance is that since 1978, when China began its reform policy to a substantial degree, it has tried to adopt international rule-based economy, and international system has been increasingly the norm that China has accepted. The key matter is that apart from its relationship with the United States and its neighboring countries, China alone cannot survive itself. And Chinese leadership knows it very well. I think that should be the starting point of our broader understanding. 
As you know very well, back in 2008, global financial crisis that began in the United States and sh sent shockwaves uh, throughout the world. Even back in 1980s when Thatcherism and Reaganism were the norms, we cannot go back to those good old days. And that has been a heated debate topic, even in US and the UK, uh, demanding norms to China is something that we can pursue. However, what is exactly the norm? How can they be defined and be formulated? That's very important in my view. To a certain degree, China is following certain norms while following not following certain norms on the other. When it comes to protectionism, uh, it's not really in line with international norms, whether it is being pursued by United States or China regarding tariffs about uh, Article 246, a sin from third countries. This is not in line with international norms. It is unilateralism imposed by the United States. So multilateralism uh, symbolized as uh, by WTO, which was advocated by the United States initially, uh, protection of in intellectual property right, as Dr. Mueller uh, 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 pointed out quite rightly, it is actually based upon multilateralism that the international community agreed upon already. Are we going to seriously tackle this issue from a multilateral perspective, which is desirable in my view? How can China be encouraged to adopt itself to embrace multilateralism? I think that's the key in our approach toward China. And lastly, uh, I think the same holds true for the Huawei issue. Huawei issue regarding key infrastructure, uh, why equipment is not used in Korea. When it comes to ICT society or highly advanced society, whether it's Huawei or any other uh, uh, company, there is a high vulnerability that uh, key national intelligence or information may be leaked and used in harmful ways. That's why there is a high need for uh, multilateralism and cooperation to make sure that that doesn't materialize, particularly uh, intelligence agencies within the United States government, if they are aware of the security breach committed by the Huawei company. And I think that key information should be shared with some key partners, including uh, allies such as United, I mean, uh, ROK. Without sharing this information, pushing for this agenda that Huawei is a violator, uh, it is a hard sell uh, to other partners, including the ROK. So th uh, once again, this uh, information, if it is true, needs to be shared more uh, actively with uh, key nations such as South Korea. Thank you. Since I already spoke to Huawei, but I'll just say, in my view, our critical goal with respect to the PRC over time is the same as it was uh, over, the, over recent years, and that's to provide conditions where China is a responsible stakeholder in the international system. China will, will want and will receive changes to that system. Some have occurred, and I'm sure more will occur in the future. Uh, but uh, part of encouraging it to be a responsible stakeholder means that we need to be responsible stakeholders as well, and not to look the other way when China misbehaves in some way. I, as allies, uh, I've, I've both from, from South Korea and from our other allies, I value times when we've been uh, told that we've been going the wrong direction, encouraged to, to adjust course. Certainly, the United States has made its share of mistakes over time. The more that the that countries can, uh, not as an alliance, but but uh, as as independent nations with with common interests in an objective of of economic growth and and supporting an international system that that is fair. Uh, with respect to trade and that's free of coercion to to be able to push back and to have the, the courage to do that on the small things so that they don't become big things i think is incredibly important uh, china is today i i believe the uh, the american phrase is sowing its oats it has a sense that it's the rising power that the united states is a declining power uh, and certainly we have work to do as a as a country there's no doubt about it uh, if we want to claim that we're the model of, of an effective democracy. But 
we've worked together. Um, I want to credit Barry Pavel, the piece several years ago on focus on, on not just the United States, but the international actors being custodians of the international system. Uh, that's, that's where we need to press. And it, in some cases, it will, it, will mean, uh, it will mean partnering closely with China. In some cases, it will mean uh, allowing them space to come into, into processes and systems. And in some cases, it'll mean imposing costs and attempting to have the strongest coalition that we can to do that so that they will change their behavior over time. Thank you. So um, I'd like to open up the floor. I will take two questions. And so two gentlemen, please identify yourself and then I would appreciate a question. Two, two gentlemen, I'll take two questions and then our panelists will. Um, Augusta Salzona, Filipino by birth, American by choice. My question is this, uh, a serious question. Um, has the uh, media, fake news, is that a problem in your country? And, uh, and that would be domestic fake news, fake news coming from China, fake news coming from Europe fake news even coming from the United States, and how are you fighting this, especially with upcoming elections and other things where people in the democratic society actually get to vote? Thank you. Gentlemen? Stafford Ward, Rand Corporation. Just was curious if anyone in the panel had um, thoughts on South Korea's, the South Korean government's cyber strategy to protect its military and civilian networks against cyber threats from China, North Korea, or their proxies. Okay, so I'd like to start with Dr. Huang, and you could answer the question, or if there is any brief comment on your previous, my previous question, that would be great too. Uh, just I want to briefly mention uh, the, uh, my uh, opinion on U.S. Um, uh, U.S. role um, in regard to uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, so far, uh, U.S. was uh, uh, counteracting to uh, the Chinese dream uh, with the America first, and then now a Belt Road initiative uh, with the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, however, uh, in order in order for the uh, U.S. Uh, to have a uh, the real competitiveness uh, in uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, it should make a more active diplomatic initiative against Chinese uh, diplomacy. China is presenting a new kind of uh, uh, international relations, Xinjiang uh, uh, following the uh, new type of great power relationship, Xinjiang Daegu Guanghe. This is to introduce and lead. Uh, the new discourse in the uh, reconstruction of international relations. So uh, I think first of all, U.S. Uh, has to uh, ha uh, has emphasized rule base uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Then the rule has to be a clear uh, and fair that even China cannot uh, uh, resist, refuse. Uh, this is the first point. Second point is, uh, in order to respond to Chinese diplomatic initiatives such as a new kind of uh, international relations, new kind of uh, uh, great power relationship, I suggest the uh, uh, U.S. may consider to develop uh, new, uh, newly, a new rise of international relations, Xinhua uh, 국제관계. Uh, maybe uh, this, uh, th this is, I'm, I'm developing uh, this concept now. Uh, maybe uh, this uh, concept might have uh, two distinct uh, features. One is, uh, uh, anyway, a new, uh, new order must uh, acknowledge for U.S. contributions in the last 70 years in a reasonable way. Uh, uh, then second point is, uh, the, the second point is, uh, but uh, this new, uh, new uh, order also reflect the partial changes in the, uh, uh, in the current order. 
Uh, anyway, there has uh, some cha uh, some uh, new new changes, so we might uh, consider more you know ideal uh, system. And then uh, uh, since uh, since the U.S. is emphasizing uh, free and open of Indo-Pacific. Uh, this kind of approach might lead China to treat Indo-Pacific as a threat. Uh, uh, maybe put it a different way, uh, uh, free and open. Then maybe to China, open and free will be more comfortable. Uh, maybe to South Korea, we, we might consider fair and open. So we might have a uh, you know, more uh, in-depth discussion um, to be followed. Uh, then, uh, fin finally, uh, I'm still you know, uh, uh, wondering, uh, so after uh, free and open, what uh, world it can, be, uh, uh, come, uh, can come? A free and open uh, world, a free and open navigation, and something else. Uh, so we might have a further discussion. Thank you. I think it is the same throughout the world. In the digital world that we live in now, and I think it's a challenge that comes by default with the coming and the arise of the digital world, including YouTube. Everybody is entitled to become a producer, not just a consumer of news. Discrimination and fakeness can become easily issues quite aggressively manifested as well. And the internet world is not being purified and being unfiltered in bad ways. And this is a challenge that we should tackle. And it is not really news, but a variety of fakeness that is being regurgitated by this media, which cannot be handled easily by the traditional uh, criminal system, because it is just too many to be tracked and tackled. Recently, the Media and the Communications Committee, which is a semi-state agency, uh, is taking on itself a, a challenge to, to monitor the situation. So they formed a consultative body to do that. Related laws are, are being uh, proposed. And, and I, I just want to note, China looks that it is experimenting with the export of tools for authoritarian, authoritarian control, uh, face recognition technology, AI engines, machine learning that help exploit that rapidly. And that's something we need to be aware of, even as we work uh, to have better tools uh, to, to overcome the challenges both within the privacy, uh, within the producers of social media in particular, uh, and to, to work on truth telling. And, and quickly on, on the South Korea cybersecurity, um, I know that the US and South Korea have begun, uh, at least through the Department of Defense, I believe other departments as well, some discussions. Speaking as a member of the Defense Science Board Task Force on this issue for the, uh, of the United States, it's a very hard problem. And uh, I hope that we do work together closely. Uh, the US doesn't have doesn't have all, uh, the problem cracked, uh, so to speak, uh, and it, it will require sustained effort to, to improve our postures. Thank you. I would like to thank our panelists again and uh, for sharing your insight and also the audience um, for staying with us till the end of the session. I hope that all um, have enjoyed this discussion and the session would have provided an opportunity to think about where we stand and uh, what, can we, what can be done on setting the strategic goals of the United States and its allies and partners in dealing with China, not only in terms of uh, competition, but also in terms of cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to invite Barry Pavel, Senior Vice President of the Atlantic Council, for his closing remarks. Thanks, I'm not gonna uh, keep you long. 
I'm not going to keep you long. Uh, just a, a, a quick uh, close. Certainly on behalf of the Atlantic Council, we wanted to thank you for participating today uh, in today's strategic dialogue. I'd also like to once again thank our great partner, the uh, East Asia Foundation, uh, for coming all this way, and all of our really distinguished speakers who did so well um, in all of our conversations. It's, it's very clear to me today that uh, the insights we gained are relevant not only for the near-term um, next steps on the Korean Peninsula regarding the negotiations, but also part of a much longer strategic conversation taking shape on the peninsula and also in the broader, in the broader region. One, one message that I think we've heard consistently today is the importance of, of a flexible approach. Um, whether that means more carefully considering the role of China in de denuclearization talks, rethinking the most effective sequencing of the steps for concrete progress, or starting a longer conversation about the Republic of Korea and U.S. approach to managing the long-term China challenge. And I thought that was a very good panel uh, that I'd like to see more of uh, because I think it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue almost, almost by the month. While a lot of the speakers highlighted the necessity of new approaches and innovative thinking, I also think it's encouraging to hear that Despite a, lot of prog despite a lack of a lot of progress on the, recently on the denuclearization, the fundamental importance and strength of the U.S.-ROK alliance remains very clear, and I think the enduring strength of the alliance was most notable in the keynote speeches from Special Representatives Lee and Began this morning, whose presence on the same stage demonstrated how both sides remain devoted to close coordination moving forward, and I really liked how uh, Representative Began took a question uh, from uh, from the audience on um, on a particular issue uh, uh, for Representative Lee. I thought that really demonstrated the closeness uh, of 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 our two countries, and and certainly to me personally, you know, our, our alliance is going to be sustained by shared societal values. The conditions are going to change. China's rising. Lots of things happening, but it's our shared values that will help us to sustain and adapt the alliance and the relationship, and I, I think make it more strategic even over the, over the next decade. So in the Scowcroft Center um, here, we certainly work to honor General Scowcroft's legacy of service and his commitment to supporting U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies, and I think we really heard a lot today that fits squarely in that mission. So right before we close, I really wanted to thank the team that pulled all of this together, and that is James and Shirley and Rogini and, and EUN and Chaz and Laura. So thanks very much, and thanks to all of you again for coming.